couple of months and no one still no one has discovered the hidden message in the intro and so that raises the question is there a hidden message or is jimmy just now making this up on the spot to see what kind of uh interaction he can get people spending more time with the video increasing our watch time one of the two is probably true i can't think of a third option but you know Whatever. Hey, everybody, this is The Sunday Show. It is September 7th, 2023. I'm Jimmy Snow. This is Matt Dillahunty. We are here to take calls from theists, atheists on, uh, on the topics of religion, spirituality, uh, ghosts, astrology, all things that a skeptic would say, hey, I'm pretty skeptical of that, especially in the realm of religion and spirituality. Matt, how are you today? I'm very tired, but I plan to get over it like almost immediately. Something about doing yeah. the show, I get pumped up. It's always fun. Um, yeah, absolutely nothing happened yesterday. Yesterday was just, <laughs> you know, a boring um, a day like any other is is basically all there was. So, yeah. you know, hopefully we get some callers. I, you know, I don't, who knows? I, uh, I did love driving, though. I, I have a slight disagreement. Uh, I think yesterday was eventful. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, d our own Matt Dillahunty went to Houston to debate a Muslim apologist live and in person. And I have to say, uh, I, well, let's do this. Do you want to go first? I have a thing. I've got a, I got a soapbox to step on. Do you want to give your uh, summary or, or any information, or do you want to just say people want to see the debate go? I mean, what do you want to do? Um, I'll give a quick little thing. Somebody in chat said, Matt sounds like he's getting a cold. Uh, I got four hours of sleep, drove six hours, and I'm hoarse from a three-hour debate yesterday. Mm -hmm. But, you know, thanks for speculation about my health. Um, so here, here's the deal. I just posted a link uh, on my Patreon. Patreon.com slash Atheist Debates. Go there, chuck in some money so that I can do more stuff and, and try to stay healthy and other things. But uh, I posted the link to the debate I did with Isa on Islam versus secular humanism. Isa called the show last week uh, as well afterwards. Um, not a great debate, but a good discussion. Yeah. Um, the, then I also posted the link to the debate that I did yesterday. I'm not going to go over it in any detail today. That's not what the Sunday show is about. I'm going to be posting debate reviews, a, a summary. I'll do one of the debate with Issa, but I'm going to do three on the debate with Daniel because the debate was split into three topics, three topics that he specifically chose and then for one, did not ever defend. For two, boring, irrelevant, you know, discussion that got nowhere. And for three showed his ass and received a fatality. Um, there's nothing that I need to say about this today other than Jimmy has thoughts. My thoughts will be in the debate reviews that I post up at the Patreon. However, that was the one and only time I will ever engage in a debate with Daniel dishonest, disgusting Hakikachu. Yeah. Yeah, I'd also like him to change his name because I'm tired of thinking of Pokemon when I hear it. Uh, it's uh, Pokemon, something I love. Daniel is somebody who I've grown to resent. I do have some thoughts, and it, and and it'll take me a minute to get through them. But I'll tell you that uh, I feel a new fire under. I don't usually watch online debates. I don't usually watch. But Matt had kind of been talking about it in advance, and uh, frankly, I just didn't have anything else to do last night. So for once, I pulled up a channel that I also. Uh, chronically avoid that channel in the past. I have even uh, condemned the channel, the runner of the channel. I technically blocked on social media after I felt some of the platforming he was doing and defending was, was beyond what uh, I liked. I do understand that that specific line he's not crossed again in some time. 
uh, and presumably wouldn't. Uh, but it's no it, it, it's no secret here that I'm not a, fa- a fan of that platform. But I'm also not a fan of what I would call at times in the past I've called it amateur debating. You can't really call it that. Matt's not an amateur. His his opponent. Uh, you know, what is the standard for amateur? Uh, bad at it, certainly. Uh, but it, it was a good summary of what I, it, I feel it resembled a lot of what I think about online debate being a bad direction debate has gone and becoming more of a sport than actually being an effective tool to actually get to the bottom of anything. This is the thing I get shit on all the goddamn time when I say debate does not is not one based on who has the most truth. It is one not based on who is the better debater or in some cases the better showman because there are times debater uh, debate winners are not established based on any sort of objective rules of debate. Uh, I will say in watching the live chat and seeing a lot of Muslims in there and it was a live chat that was on subscriber only mode. So people who follow that channel and, and are subscribed to it, uh, that doesn't mean anything. We have people on this channel who I'm sure I resent that are subscribed. That's not meant to imply anything. They have an extremely low standard Muslims of who a winner is. Are you raising your hand or checking your blood sugar? I, I'm, I'm raising my hand real briefly. Uh, I will say that there's a dramatic difference between the live chat and the comments that went up on the video afterwards. Sure, sure. Uh, and maybe that's because some more responsible moderation happened, uh, which was severely lacking in the, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but I, I literally wrote as I was going, this is like watching a UFC fighter fighting a 12-year-old purple belt. Uh, like it's, it's like watching, there's no way. And if anything, I guess this is the closest thing I have to say. That's a little bit critical, but Matt already kind of acknowledged a lot of this as far as critical of Matt's side, there's no way to definitively a UFC fighter fighting a 12 year old purple belt. They will win, but will they, it's kind of like that saying, uh, if you wrestle with a pig, you both get dirty, but the pig likes it. Um, and, uh, uh, I will say that one thing that I learned that I think that that Matt will probably not, uh, well, you tell me was last night a moment where you went never again. Will I debate specifically a proposition? I can't actually agree to because of the way that will be abused by the person who would, because you had mentioned that you sort of settled for some of the propositions, the debate propositions where you're like, I still don't like this, but fine to make it happen. We'll do it. Would you still do that? Or would you insist that a, a reasonable proposition um, become to? Well, I'm, I'm normally very particular about, um, what debate topics I accept. And I'm, I'm highly critical. Even if some of my good friends have, have accepted debates on topics that, uh, I, I think was a, absolutely a mistake, uh, to, to engage in. In this case, there are some people that are more difficult than others. And the goal for me here was, um, I had already agreed when, um, James asked me, I'd already agreed to debate this guy. And then I watched him debate Michael Jones, um, on whether or not it's okay to marry four-year-olds and nine-year-olds. And immediately I was like, I, I, I don't want to do this debate, but I, I had a commitment to it and I like to, you know, if I say I'm going to do something, I do something. So the goal was I wanted to make this the debate to end Daniel Hakikachu uh, so that nobody else ever feels any need to pay any attention to him at all. And because of that, I strategically made a couple of decisions. Number one is that while he changed what the topic was a couple of times, he came with a proposal of doing three one-hour debates on three different topics that were related. And in his mind, the whole thing together was, was Islam true. I wanted to have a debate on just the third one, secular humanism versus Islam. Yeah. And specifically so that I could teach him something about consent because he yeah. doesn't understand it. Or care about He might understand it and yeah. just not value it, which well, I think is the case. That's what happens when you're a misogynist. Yeah. Um, but... He, um, he kept coming back with this and I was like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to accept all of his debate topics and I'm going to prep for those debate topics and I'm going to fucking hold him to those debate topics. 
And then when it was right before the debate, normally the person with the affirmative side goes first. But since the final one was a comparison, it didn't really matter who goes first. And I was talking with James and I was like, hey, who, who's going to go first? And he's like, well, normally it'd be Daniel. And I was like, I don't mind going first. We can flip a coin and alternate or he can go first or I can go first. The truth is, I absolutely wanted to go first in all three of those. But I was fine either way. My openings were, were designed such that, see, we're basically doing my debate review now. My openings were designed such that it wouldn't matter. But Daniel, I wanted to give him every decision. So he decided that I would go first every time. So he picked the topics, he chose for me to go first, and I just smiled. And for yeah. the entire first hour, the topic was, is there evidence of God? And I held him to that and would not let him push a different direction. Yeah, even in the third hour, which this goes into my next point, in the third hour, he, it, when it was which is better, secular humanism or Islam, Matt did a presentation, an intro 10 minutes, defending secular humanism. And then Daniel did his 10 minutes not defending Islam, instead attacking a caricaturized version of secular humanism that has nothing to do with secular humanism, that at times just conflates secular with secular humanism, but at other times suggests people like George W. Bush were agents of secular humanist ideology yeah. in in invading Iraq and invading Afghanistan and the like. This is this is so this was one of the top notes I have. Daniel would have gotten a failing a failing grade if he was in an actual debate class, debate com club, debate community for spending more time representing straw men than ever defending his side of the proposition. The very first uh, uh, the very first hour was him trying to essentially declare an argument ad populum to intuition and then later backing off as soon as anybody would challenge that. Well, I'm not saying that's the whole thing, even though that was his big thing and his, well, intuition could be evidence, which it's sort of one of those stupid ones. Your intuition is evidence when it's right, but it's not when it's wrong. Another stupid uh, 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 sort of summary of his position. Uh, and the intuition stuff made it, it literally, he spent so much time on it to then pretend that it wasn't his most important point. And it wasn't like it was so fucking bad. He doesn't even understand the uh, the concept of intuition, no matter how popular, is not adequate. If you have an intuition, you then seek confirmation, period. But like anyway, speaking of the moderation and part of uh, uh, why I am excited for us to do our own thing. Yeah. Without calling out names, the moderator, I feel, was dog shit uh, and said that if necessary, if things got too out of hand. It would have the format would change broken up into time slots where one person's microphone would be activated and the other wasn't. This never happened. And that couldn't have the, the, the qualifying events that would have triggered that couldn't have happened more. At one point with Daniel offering an implicitly violent threat, implicitly violent threat to Matt, as well as beginning to make ad hominems toward Matt and not just Matt. But Matt's family uh, crossing an absolute fucking line. And, and still this this thing that was put up, which to me also says that the moderator understood this could happen. I don't know why the format didn't then change to it when it could have used it. Uh, I mean, I know how to run the thing. And I mean, if we're going to get into the production and I can shit on that all day, I'm just going to say to the person who does production, I'm not going to shit on you. It's very easy to make a split screen that is a compilation of the two closer videos. You only rely on the wide shot for the occasional scene establishment, and then you do the split screen and you get better reactions and stuff that way. Also, cross film, do not parallel film. There, there were a number of technical issues. And yeah. one of the things that I mentioned at, this, at the start of the debate was that James managed to get Daniel and I to agree on something. And that was, we were talking about the microphone levels. And where they were was a problem because they were constantly clipping before mm -hmm. the debate started. And then Daniel worked with him uh, to get the, you know, the levels kind of correct. I think what modern day debates really need to do, and I know that they're, they're trying to amp up their game soon, but if you saw the way the production worked, you, you would be like, 
I mean, you can't even be critical of it. It's a single laptop, no mixer, a couple cameras running into a couple splitters and the microphones uh, in a really cramped. This was a tiny venue in a, in a Holiday Inn well outside of town or on, on the edge of town, basically, is what it felt like. So I think that they're, I, I think that the, the people running modern databases are likely to make a number of, of good improvements on the tech front for a while. But the reason it didn't happen to start muting mics was primarily a technical issue where I don't think it could have happened. Yeah. Um, I know how I would have fixed it on the fly, but also their basic, I don't know. I have a guess of how much money they're making and I have long since separate from my criticism of the quality and the, and the, uh, uh, dumpster style, dumpster fire chasing style videos that I feel they do. Uh, I haven't understood how it is maintained it is still maintained at the level it's maintained at. And by the way, uh, two, two modern day debates, even though I have problems, you can hire me and I'll fix it all. You can pay me at, for a consult and I will tell you how I would have fixed what you did. Uh, uh, but it will also require a budget because the hardware that you're still running this many years and past 100,000 and that you're trying to put multiple people on Yeti microphones, uh, that was just silly. Uh, but anyway, again, the production stuff is not something that I, I want to just just harp on ad nauseum. In fact, it's not even in my notes here. That was just that I had messaged you something like I could fart out better production in my sleep. Um, anyway, uh, I thought it was very funny. Daniel having the audacity to say, come say that over here to my face, but also whine at you for quote unquote grandstanding. Yeah. Yeah. That, that one I want to address real quick. So. Uh, there were people that are like, oh my God, Matt got up and got angry and got in Daniel's face. First of all, um, I was trying to answer a question that he wouldn't let me answer. And I was basically saying, if you'll shut up for a minute, I'll fucking tell you. And he's like, come over here and say that. He didn't, and that, when you do the come over here and say that, it's an implicit threat. So that, that was the thing that already ramped it up. But I, I did it on purpose to make a point. At that point, I'm not angry. Matter of fact, I, I think you'll see that I was smiling through a good chunk of that. Because when somebody says that to me in a debate, okay, you've said, you've asked me to come over and say that. So I walk over there and I say it. And when I get there, he's like, do something, you know, or, or he said something like that. Like he was expecting me to attack. And I'm like, I have no interest in fighting anybody. You asked me to come over and say that to your face. I'm just letting you know that I'm willing to come over and say it to your face. If you'll shut the fuck up, I will answer your question. Yeah. Yeah, it was literally, I, I understood what it was when I watched it. I know Matt, Matt has never, Matt, I think is willing to take a punch, uh, but he's never instigating a punch. He, you didn't walk over there not thinking he might hit you. It just didn't bother you if that is what was I happen. suspected there would be absolutely no violence, but I knew that if anything violent happened, it would be 100% of the part of Daniel because yeah. I've never punched anybody in my entire life. Yeah, I love that. He said, go, I don't know if you could hear it because of all the ruckus that was happening, but he said, uh, come over here. You went over and just said, okay, I'm here to say it. And then as you were going back and as the moderator was, was directing you back, he started joining it. Yeah. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Well, make yeah. up your mind, Daniel. Did you want him to come over there or did you want him to sit down? But there were yeah. other instances like that where y you would say, you don't get to decide how I respond to it. Go, Actually, I do. Yes, I can. I am right now. I'm doing it. It's literally just. A fucking childish little bitch. Yeah, it was, it was funny. It, it was sad, too, because it, it, the middle hour, we had quite a bit of almost reasonable discussion about a topic that's completely irrelevant. Yep. Um, here's one that was just a nitpick that I even threaded about. What does the phrase, we all know it is wrong to harm someone for no reason? There isn't a really a way to harm someone for no reason other than accidents and incidental, and those aren't right or wrong. It's possible to have inadequate reason. It's possible even to not articulate your reasoning. But if you see someone and just go, I've decided I want to punch that person and then do it, that isn't actually without reason. It's just with really shit reasoning, like I think my impulses should be louder than my resistance. Uh, and he kept repeating that, and I, I just got very pedantic about it. There's no such thing. I, I mean, unless you've got one. How how would you harm a person for no reason that isn't incidental or accidental? Yeah, it's. I, I'm not completely sure. This was the this was the question he kept posting about harming someone for no reason, and I, I left it alone on purpose because he kept raising it during the first part. 
where it wasn't relevant and he hadn't done his job in the first part. I was waiting for him to bring it up, bring it up in a later part because I would argue that um, marrying a nine-year-old is harming them and it's not for no reason. It's because you're a disgusting individual. I, I had that one kind of saved up, but we yeah, didn't get I, there. Just like my favorite question that I asked last night, I don't, I didn't, I wasn't watching chat. I don't know what the response was. I don't care, but I had, there was one question that I prepared early and I was very cautious about how I led up to it, but because everything devolved immediately after he started attempting to answer the question and then dodged it, it never got an answer. And that question was, does Islam encourage and support terrorism or is it just really bad at preventing its adherents from engaging in terrorism? Right. His response was immediately, oh, you want to talk about terror? Well, and then start talking about the 9-11 terrorism as a secular humanist terrorist yeah. response. Uh, so he, 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 it wasn't just that it didn't, it was that he was avoiding. Uh, but that was around the time, too, where he was saying when you, you sort of offhandedly as a joke, because it's what he was implying when he used the word consent, said something along the lines of, yes, I'm good with educational rape, that he starts just screaming this to mean that a, a child be compelled to get education, not actually be raped. He just starts ha! and just screams the phrase educational rape over and over. He favors educational yeah. rape. I was waiting for you to go, unlike Daniel, who just favors old fashioned rape. But you didn't say I, 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 did thought that would be I did something a little bit similar. Um, but the other thing is, and this is weird, is it, it didn't fully hit me until I got home. Yeah. But and this may be in your notes. He was railing against not secular humanism, but a straw man of secular humanism that has hedonistic maximized pleasure as its foundation. Yep. And yet I'm the one that's saying we shouldn't be having sex with children and he is how can i as a secular humanist who's supposed to be maximizing pleasure be opposed to something that he clearly finds pleasurable yeah it was funny too because he kept representing secular humanism as preferring individual pleasure over the greater good meanwhile uh totally ignoring that in a secular humanist society one person Getting more irrelevant. pleasure while harming several other people would be anti-secular humanist and would disregard yeah, it's, it's not the secular madism. Right. It's He's, not about me. It's secular humanism. It's about humans, all of us. By the way, do you know who was the first person to say don't interrupt me during the show? He was. Yep. Do you know who was the person who interrupted during the show? He did. Exactly. I, I, to be fair, I interrupted as well, but right off the bat, I interrupted him. And he said, he, he called me out for it. And like many other things, um, I'm, I'm Machiavellian in some of my strategy. And I was like, okay, I won't interrupt him. I will sit here quietly. I will hold him to the topic and I will point out every time he interrupts me. And for the next few times that he interrupted, I was like, you interrupting, you interrupting, you interrupt. And it, and it, that's just what sticks in people's head. And the truth is it's silly. Because in a debate like that, we are both going to interrupt each other. It, that's just the way these things go. Um, but if you're going to be a whiny little bitch about it at the start, I'm going to call you out. I actually had a, a note about that. You don't need a moderator in a lot of these conversations when the two individuals have a baseline respect for the humanity of the other. Not to say that they actually respect each other, but they have a respect for the humanity of the other. So in other words... You and Jordan Peterson, I don't think, have much respect or love for each other, but you have a baseline human respect for, again, each other's humanity, and you were able to have a very productive conversation without a moderator present. And by the way, that debate, conversation, whatever you want to call it, had lots of interruptions, but it wasn't one where either side was upset and, in fact, even usually let the other person who interrupted finish because it was understood of you're interrupting because you think that I've just said something wrong. So I'm going to let you correct it and then respond to the updated one. It actually interruptions when, when in a, in an actual debate that looks like a debate, a real debate and not just loud mouth assholes uh, on a stage screaming, don't interrupt me. Uh, and I said fuck a lot too, but I got, I got, uh, um, applause from a 12 year old who was fine with it the only it. young per person in the room so i just thought it was yeah the the interruptions wouldn't have been a problem in a debate that actually could have survived without a moderator this was one that i will once again say it should have gone to the other format um 
All of Daniel's opening statements were free of the defense of their actual proposition. That's why it would have failed. I think that's most of the stuff. I did put little notes in like sign me up for the pleasure machine. Um, <laughs> Cause it sounded great. Uh, let's see. And, 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 in Daniel's world, if the pleasure machine happened, it's not just that there would be a pleasure machine. It would be you would have no choice but to be in the pleasure yep. machine. And I'm we, saying... We, because he views secular humanism as a totalitarian regime forcing people to join the pleasure. Yeah. Um, already did that. Uh, Daniel's magical analogies of secular humanism because he couldn't use actual facts. Oh, right. That is what the pleasure machine was. He also, he, he added elements to of it that are also impossible. So he, he's, here's a thought experiment. Imagine nothing about this world is how it is. And the future is how it won't be, uh, in this thought experiment anyway. And then accused Matt of not knowing what thought experiments were just a short period later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. uh, he kept trying to use the phrase, cognitive colonialism or forced colonialism to describe the spread of secular humanism. Meanwhile, uh, doesn't want to use that term because I think he thinks it's a power an empowered term that comes from the woke side that if you use it, people aren't going to push back. Uh, not realizing that the spread of Muslim of Islam would also be in, in what he is defending cognitive colonialism. It literally would just mean anybody who comes up with something and then shares it and its popularity is then adhered to and more people start to believe it, you're a cognitive colonial colonialist uh, or a religious colonialist. It was one of the terms he used too. Uh, but I also thought there's an interesting point. Daniel claims that secular humanism is forced colonialism and that people are forced to be secular humanists against their will. And yet also believes that Allah will punish secular humanists. So Allah will punish people for adhering to a belief system that Daniel believes they don't have a choice but to believe. An interesting contradiction. Uh, and then, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, I will say we're going to get to. I'll say running. a positive. I'll say a positive thing about Daniel, um, uh, coupled with a negative. And somebody else in chat already mentioned this, but it's something I discussed at the time too. Um, he made some valid points about the damage done by the United States of America uh, under the guise of spreading democracy places and the and and how we have and and I pointed out by the way he tried to saddle me with this and secular humanism with this and everything else that was a delusional part but there's a real problem there and it's something that. Uh, I'm not in complete agreement with Sam Harris's view on. I'm definitely in disagreement with Hitchens' view on. Um, I think, I don't know for sure if I would say that uh, Bush is necessarily guilty of war crimes only because I'm not a lawyer who, who has the knowledge to say that, but I am uh, opposed to and regretful about things that my country has done, which has resulted in increasing hatred of America, is increased the the likelihood that someone is going to become a jihadi and support al-qaeda and these other things we have in many ways while, while we've done some things that made the world better we have made the situation worse in some ways and so he was right to point it out but his anger was so misdirected that he was like and this is matt you know matt's fault and secular human's fault and i'm like i pose that same thing but it doesn't yeah. matter because any time that I said I was leading towards something that he would have had to agree with or would have had to acknowledge that I made a point, all he did was shout over me. Yeah. I'm ready for calls. We've got a new theist, some repeat theist calling as well, but we've got a new yeah, theist a online I'm ready to talk to. Uh, Off that debate. Watch it some other time. Exactly. Howard in Spain, uh, pronouns he, him, is a theist with five reasons why theism is more rational position to hold than atheism. Howard, you are on the line with Jimmy Snow and Matt Dillahunty. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Sure. Happy Welcome. To. Thanks. Um, I argue that theism is a more rational position for a true skeptic than atheism is. And okay, I've got five reasons to argue that point. I, I appreciate that. I want to, just for clarity, um, let's, let's go through them one at a time rather than dumping all five of them. Yeah. Um, so you're th sure. saying theism is more rational for a true skeptic. What's a true skeptic? Somebody that um, follows the scientific method. Okay. Instead so, of so just um, you, you, following what that, scientists say. No, no, no. 
the, the scientific the skepticism is not following what scientists say. It's following what the data from science indicates. Like I said, I believe that a true skeptic is somebody that follows the scientific method and tests things for themselves rather than believing what a scientist says and not verifying it. Okay. Um, so you're saying a true skeptic is only someone who does the science themselves, not someone who assesses the data and goes with a consensus. Pretty much. If you can't do it yourself, then maintain an open mind. Remain uh, skeptical. Is, so, so my mind is open even if I go with the scientific consensus. I can proportion my confidence level to the evidence. But we're not going to agree on this part. So what's reason number one that theism is more rational than, than atheism for a what you call a true skeptic? Sure. Well, I've got reproducible primary observations at water level. And I've got reproducible primary observations at high altitude. I fucking knew, it. I fucking knew it. Within two sentences of this call, I fucking knew we were talking to a flat earther. I knew it. I'm Go not ahead, Alan. Earther. Oh, okay. Give your water level things that have nothing to do with flat earth then. Go on. Uh, as I said, I'm a skeptic. Oh, I'm you're a, a globe, globe skeptic. skeptic. I'm not a flat earther. And I've offered uh, to debate Matt on this. Okay. But right, right. It but seems like Howard, I'm do you not up for it. Do you accept that the earth is a globe or an oblique spheroid? As I say, I'm a globe skeptic. Right, right. You're I've not a flat earther, you're a globe skeptic. Okay, go ahead, Howard. I'll shut yeah. the fuck back up and let you no, do no, your no, five no. stupid points. Um, Thank so, you, I appreciate I, that. No, I, I'm not ready. So before you do that, um, what on earth does globe skepticism have to do with theism? Well, um, if the globe's a lie, then that means that um, we're not floating through an infinite space. So that kind of debunks uh, gravity, it debunks, it debunks the Big Bang, it debunks fake space being physical when it could most likely be metaphysical, higher dimensions no, sir. No, than sir. physical bodies no, sir. to travel to. No, sir. No, sir. You cannot construct a logical syllogism that is both valid and sound that begins with, I doubt that the Earth is a globe, therefore theism is true. A, a, a valid and sound syllogism. I doubt. I, I'm still talking. A valid and sound syllogism yeah, is one where there are major. Me. I, I'm still fucking talking, and you will not be talking if you interrupt me one more time. A valid and sound syllogism has a major and minor premise and a connecting term. The conclusion must include that. You can't have anything in the conclusion that isn't in the premises. The conclusion, therefore, God exists, means that God must be present in one of the premises and in the premise that you are are doubtful of the globe that does not include a god so construct a valid and sound syllogism that leads to therefore there is a god I was trying to, but you both have interrupted me twice now. So if I may try, I'm going to hang up on you great. if you don't stop being a whiny little bitch and do what you say you can do. I muted Howard. I want to ask you, Matt. Do you really want to do the call? My proposal is no. no from the past. I, so the the globe skeptics are science deniers yes. who fancy themselves as skeptics, but don't understand what skepticism is, and don't understand the the world at all. And, and they think that, oh, if I doubt the globe and I'm right, well, therefore, there's a God. No, that does not follow. That is a non sequitur. They don't understand logic. I, I couldn't possibly care less what Howard has to say. I'm going to do something we've never done before, Howard. I'm not hanging up on you yet. I'm going to put Howard back in the queue, and I'm going to poll the live chat. And if the live chat all agrees we should take the call, I will give Howard a few more minutes after another call. And if Howard in that time decides he's going to uh, uh, behave, we'll take it. However, I'm going to tell this to the chat before I say it. The reason why I think we shouldn't is that I feel the atheist community, and I've, I've put this out there before, is in some ways, the atheist online YouTube community is in some ways responsible for the spreading of the, I won't call it popular sentiment, but the sentiment of flat earthism. 
that years ago it became a very easy way to get views and it was very funny and they started to do this sort of us versus them thing and then people started becoming flat earthers and that that message was actually popularized by people who were making a joke out of it and I don't think it is actually useful because they are so easily debunked they are so it, it is so obvious that they are poor thinkers I don't think we should however I will put in the poll it's going to be take the call or hang it up. And if, uh, you know, for all I know, Howard is going to decide to hang up uh, and not, but maybe he will let the audience decide too. Uh, and and if, if that happens, here, it's in there now. If it is told to take the call, Howard, I'm putting you back in the queue. And if the audience agrees, we should hear from you. I will bring you back on, but I can't say that it necessarily will be for long. You have full autonomy to decide whether you're going to wait in the queue or not. Good luck. Yeah, I just don't think it. Nah, I don't care. <laughs> I, I, there, this wasn't I'm going to put you back in the queue, but first you get some things to say. You can decide whether or not you want to remain in the queue and try again. If the when, audience when somebody should. jumps in with the, well, you've both interrupted me. Um, no, what happened was we started the call and you decided that you were going to move forward. And I had clarifying questions. Um, that's always going to happen. But at the end of the day, we can interrupt you as much as we want. And whining about it will guarantee that we do it more. If you yep. just take your lumps, ask, answer the questions that you're asked. But the thing is, Howard's already demonstrated that he doesn't understand skepticism. Um, and he, you know, I have direct observations from water level. Okay. Unless you observed God at the water level, it's irrelevant to an argument for the existence of God. Sorry that you don't understand logic or skepticism or anything in that realm. Uh, I'm also being told by some, so Howard, since I know you can hear on hold, if you are in fact biblically, go ahead and hang up. I don't care what the poll response is. If if that is who mm. you are, you may leave. Uh, uh, and I will allow my audience to verify those who wild. are aware of him that, uh, right. that it is or isn't you. Uh, go ahead and pick the next one. I'm going to increase the slow mode for the moderators uh, well, as they since, requested while you're doing that i'm going to take one that's not a theist um anise pronouns she they in oregon has a question for me that hopefully i can clarify anise, anise? You're, you're on the line with jimmy and matt oh i'm sorry can you hear me now sure do yes all right uh i okay i heard you say matt that uh, Christian apologists have come up with harmonizations for every contradiction in uh, no, the Bible. No, you didn't. And I was wondering, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you, but you didn't hear me say that. There's no way in hell I've ever said that Christian apologists have come up with harmonizations for every proposed contradiction in Scripture. That I would never say anything like that. I'm sorry, I misspoke um, or misremembered. Uh, but the gist of what I recall you saying was that if a atheist or wants to talk about contradictions in scripture, they should be aware of the harmonizations that apologists have come up with. Sure, and I'm yeah. sure that's not verbatim, but is that something you'd agree to or am I misremembering? Yeah. Yeah, one of, there's there's okay. two aspects. Uh, there, there's you see a contradiction, not, not you specifically. Someone looks at scripture and sees two verses or or two passages of of some length that appear to contradict each other. The next question then is: Are there within Christendom? Are, are there within the the theology that uh, adheres to these, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, etc., for the Bible? Are there explanations from apologists that provide some understanding or model that either uh, eliminates or, or eases whatever contradiction there? That's important because if you, uh, if you just go, hey, I read this verse and this verse, and they're contradictory, and you didn't bother to look into anything that the people who've studied it the most have to say about it, then if there's a really easy resolution to this, like, when, when Jesus is called the son of man, there was somebody who came in the other day and was like, oh, he's the son of man, not the son of God. It says so in the Bible. Well, 
that's not a contradiction. You just don't understand what it says. And if you'd have done, if he would have done any research at all, he would have found out, oh, I've misunderstood what this means. Um, and so, yeah, finding out um, what apologists say about these things is important. Yeah. Um, so my question is, do you have any resources or methods that you recommend for people who want to study these things? I've been trying just Google searches and I'm getting like a bunch of garbage. Yeah. So um, e-sword.net is a multi-Bible utility that I've shown several different times. Um, that it, it's the, the first place that I start before I go out to Google. I wonder if I can, I, I don't know if I, I'm not set up to, to share my screen currently, but what it is, is there are, I'm not watching. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> all right. Go to <laughs> e-sword.net, download the utility and all the different Bible versions and all the different commentaries are there. And then you can go in and find um, the passage that you're talking about, for example, just randomly clicking. If you were in Deuteronomy 20 verses one through nine, there's a commentary from Paul Kretzmann on there. There's a commentary from Keelan Delich on there. There's a commentary from uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown there, from John Gill. Um, and, and so you can go through and read what these biblical scholars uh, have to say about this. And they're not always going to address everything that you find as a contradiction. You're probably going to have to do some Google searching, which is what I do after that. Uh, but if there's something that has been proposed as a contradiction, there will quite often be some commentary that saying, uh, here's what this passage means. Here's how we understand it. There's supposedly some, you know, contradiction with this other one, but here's why that's not a contradiction. Um, but most of the time, right after looking it up in e-sword or i should just say e-sword um the next thing i do is just type the the actual passage into google and see what comes up okay awesome thank you so much thanks anise yeah no worries thanks all right the poll is in it's already definitive here's what i'm willing to try i'm going to bring howard on the line oh boy Howard, I'm not, uh, don't hang up yet. Don't start talking yet. I'm going to ask you a question. The answer will be yes or no. And if the answer is yes, we will continue. If the answer is no, we will politely end the call. You have in our notes that you have five reasons why theism is a more rational position than atheism. I am unwilling to expose my audience to what I call flat earth stuff. You call it globe skepticism. We'll go with globe skepticism. Are you able to make your justifications to defend the rationality of theism with zero appeals to global skepticism? Globe skepticism was just one of the four points. So you could you could say we won't talk about the globe or do globe skepticism at all and you'll still be able to have the call. And nothing will be lost. Correct. If you guys are scared to... No, nope. the answer is yes or no. We're not doing... Okay, so I guess the answer is no. I, but I can mute you so fast. I'm going to ask you one more you time. Know, can you know what's you... ridiculous? What's ridiculous here, Howard, is that you immediately assume that we're scared. Uh, first of all, for nearly two decades, I've been taking on callers on all sorts of subjects. But there are things that are m demonstrably, monumentally, a stupid fucking waste of time. And globe skepticism is one of them. This is not about us being scared. You, the globe skepticism has been, I have friends that you can contact. Um, go, go argue with Simon Dan. This is something that he spends a good deal of time doing. Go uh, argue with um, um, conspiracy cats. This is something he spends time doing. That's not what this show is about. This show is about defending claims like a God exists or that it's rational to believe a God exists. So if only one of your five relies on your globe skepticism, skip that one. And can you present the next one that has nothing to do with globe skepticism? Yeah. I, I'm going to put it this way before I unmute you. Were I to take your call on flat earth, regardless of if you think or globe skepticism, regardless of whether you think you won or not, the internet will overwhelmingly agree that I won. And the clip that is made out of it will net me personally at least $1,200.
for no extra work except just cutting it out. That is likely the case because the internet loves the ones that are titled Jimmy Snow and Matt Dillahunty eviscerate Flat Earther. Not only are we not afraid by not engaging you in something that wouldn't be terribly difficult, (laughs) we will make less money. It is against our personal interest to not do it. And yet I am still going to say, so this is the, this is the last time we're going to try this mute off thing. Your two questions, you'll just say yes or no it, twice in a row. You'll say yes, yes, no, no, yes, no. One, can you do it without uh, uh, appealing to globe skepticism? And two, will you do it without appealing to globe skepticism? The only answers I want are yes, yes, or yes, no, or no, no. For the moment, go ahead. Yes. And? Yes. Cool. What's your, what's your first non-global skepticism argument that theism is more rational than atheism? Okay. Before you guys get triggered, the second point was that um, wow. if we're nope. geocentric nope. instead nope. of hel- heli- Nope. Nope. I'm going to mute you. Let me, I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to, I'm going to unmute you in a second. We just got through this to where you agreed to present your case. Instead of presenting your case, you decided to be a little snot and suggest before you guys get triggered. We're not triggered. You're a delusional buffoon. There's not going to be a triggering here. What there is is we are here to provide the best content and the best information to try to get to the truth of the matter for the audience. So now I'm going to unmute you and I'm going to ask you another question. Jimmy asked you if you can demonstrate this without global skepticism. Yes. Then he asked if you would and you said yes. And now I'm going to ask you another question. Can you do it without being a snarky little bitch? The can point you? was that it's space um, can you? skepticism. Can you? Was my se- my can second you? point was space can you? skepticism. Can you? can you answer my question and can you do this without being snarky? I'm trying, but you keep censoring no, me. So no, no. All right, of- Howard. I, see, here's the thing, Howard. When I ask you a question, I want an answer to that question. My question is not licensed for you to start doing the thing. The, the Answer the question so that I will then give you permission to start doing the thing. I hope that's clear. Are you able to do this without being snarky? Let's give it a shot, eh? I'll take that as I'm a yes. Ready to, I'm ready to present another argument if you let me. Yeah. Well, hey, go ahead, right. even though I'm already aware that it's essentially in the same category, but you're going to hide behind that technically this isn't globe skepticism. It's the heliocentric skepticism that's still a part of the flat earther toolkit, but I'm not a flat earther. Go ahead, Howard. It, thank you. It was that if we've got a special location, geocentrism, you know, whatever shape earth is, I don't know. Um, that that would mean nope, that we've been done. placed with intent. You're done. You're done. You my- did it. You did it. I'm dropping you. Whatever shape is, oh, I don't I, know. So. I told you not to appeal to it even once. You decided to slide it in. You decided you were still going to pull it off. You're done. You're done. I'm sorry, Matt, but I already no, was. No, no, no. no I, I just, I, I don't, you know, you're fine. I, I don't give a fuck about that. I want to address what he actually said. His argument was, if we have a special location, that means there was placement. So, A... The fact that we have a location doesn't mean that it was a special location that required placement. You would actually have to demonstrate that. And if your your way of demonstrating that is, of course, reliant on your globe skepticism because you reject the physics that deal with gravity and everything else. Until you can disprove gravity, um, because even if it doesn't work for Earth, It seems to work for everything else that's out there. But even if you could show that we are, that that Earth is unique and distinct and is placed in a very special position, the fact that it is in a special position does not mean that it was placed there, and it does not mean that it was placed there by a god. You, sir, are incapable of, so far, of constructing a valid and sound syllogism that leads to God. Your confusion about the way logic works, about the way skepticism works, about the way reality works, not only is manifest in the sloppy arguments that you try to present, but it manifests in your globe skepticism itself. I no longer care to have any discussions with you, Howard, whether you're biblically, Howard, whatever else, don't call me again. 
there there are people saying not biblically but howard from modern day debates which i don't oh, know i, that I makes don't have sense. a frame of reference yeah the, the, from from the delusional cesspool yeah uh, go 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 contact simon dan and dan i'm sorry to send him your way but i know you i know you you have a good time with it somebody said conspiracy cats doesn't have a uh, a page anymore i think they do but they've changed their name from conspiracy cats specifically to something else cats but i, I could be wrong uh in a sort cool. of similar vein just to get it out of the way i'm gonna start this call with andrew by asking a very direct question so uh, Andrew, you're on the line with Jimmy and Matt. Last week you called to tell me that I was forgiven for something I didn't ask forgiveness wow. for and something that you couldn't speak on behalf of. This week you have called in with a question directed at Matt. Is that because, since the question actually applies to the both of us, have you isolated to just Matt because you know if you try and talk to me it ain't going to go so well? <laughs> no, no. I just I had Matt in mind because he um, was talking smack like in the chat when I was on with uh, Godless Engineer. But I'll talk to both of you. Great. Um, Go ahead. I was talking smack in the chat when you were on with Godless Engineer. Um, oh, wait. You called in when when um, when he was on with Josh? Um, yeah. What smack, did, what smack did I talk? You're saying that I invented my own God, that progressive Christians invent their own God? Well, some do, but Based. I my my argument was essentially that yes, the way you described it is you've been invented your own god. Well, how is that smack talk? How is me assessing your argument and finding a flaw in it? How is that smack talk? Christians will find persecution anywhere. Yeah. You're not being persecuted, you're just wrong. I didn't say persecution. Yes, you okay. didn't use that exact word. So, I have beef with anyone who advocates for a position that they can't justify. And so if you compare your version of the Christian God to, let's say, Westboro Baptist Church's version of the Christian God, theirs is more biblically sound than yours. I think you would agree with that, right? Biblically sound? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So instead yes. of relying on the Bible, what are you relying on for your understanding of God? the bible all religions secular secularism nature everything we have our hands on okay so the bible religion secularism nature there's nothing about nature that has any information discernible about god there's nothing about secularism that has anything discernible about god um you've already said that you're not as in accordance with the bible as as others are when what you said during the call was that when you had to try to figure out that the whole goal was to try to figure out who God was, what God wants, et cetera, and that you relied on whether or not you found uh, the God ideas appealing. That is by definition, you being the foundation of determination. Your mind determines which things are of God and which things are not of God. De uh, determining is, a, is not the word I would use. It's the word I use. The lid on, okay, it's accurate. This is the official when, when, God. when there's a position, when say, there's a position, and somebody says, "How do you tell whether something in the Bible is actually from God, or if it's something that the Hebrews got wrong?" Your answer was that you rely on whether or not you're willing to accept it. That your mind is the criteria that you use to determine whether or not the Bible's view on slavery is the ancient Hebrews getting it wrong or God. And you don't think it's God. Correct. Yeah. And you don't think it's God, not because of nature, not because of secularism, not because of any of the other things you listed, and not because of the Bible. You don't think it's God because you have a personal idea of God that is inconsistent with what that passage says. Yes, that is true. That is you inventing. Me, that is you inventing your own God. How dare you accuse me of misrepresenting you? I, inventing? Um, I, I think that's a leap. I, I think that's not. I don't think. I don't inventing. care what We're you think. I, I, I don't care what you think. I didn't out. care what you thought about God. I don't care what you think about my assessment of you. From a biblical standpoint, you are not a biblically based Christian. 
You are a personal Christian. You are relying on your own understanding, which the Bible condemns. Okay. Hey, are um, you on speakerphone? Yeah, Why are your birds as loud as you? I'm outside. I have AirPods. Okay. Cool. It's just So now we've explained what I have beef with and what I don't. What's the point? That the majority of the world is nowhere near becoming atheist. We're better off. I don't care. Christian. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I, I, I don't care the whether whether or not you think the majority of the world is 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 and uh, soon to become atheist or not. How is that relevant to anything we're discussing? By the way, Andrew, if the, the, as an argument, one, you don't know if it's not, and two, whether or not we would still work to dismantle progressive theism does not mean we would suggest that there isn't a useful utility in a person's ability to deconstruct for there to be a progressive step along the way. I happen to think that that is an overblown thing that most people uh, don't need the progressive step and that usually the progressive step isn't a method of transition, but a method of basically keeping uh, people and internal conflict happy and wanting to still be Christian despite not really being Christian. But what you, as an argument, that that meant nothing. Whether or not I would still take a progressive Christian and try to uh, apply skepticism and see if I can deconstruct them even from progressive Christianity does not mean that I also think progressive Christianity has no use or that I wish it would just disappear at the same level of priority and quickness as everything else. Sure. Sure, you're wrong. Is I mean, the, the honest sentence would have been, sure, I'm wrong on, on my argument. Yeah, my just beef. like you called in to say, what's my beef with progressive Christianity? And then when it turns out, um, I was not in any way misrepresenting your view. You give up and move on to say the world's not ready to become atheistic yet, which has nothing to do with why you called or what we were discussing. Um, I don't value your opinion because I don't find you to be a reasonable person. I've got a question for you, Andrew. Foundationally, does progressive Christianity still advocate for a world in which people may accept something as true on the basis of faith or not. Faith is part of the ultimate. Yes or no. You're saying yes, but you're yes, trying to. Yes, okay. Yes. That's okay, my yes. beef with Christianity. It is still advocating for a foundation, which even progressive Christians seem to agree has never been demonstrated to actually get you to truth. And so then we get to a conflict where if you say, I believe in progressive Christianity, and it doesn't harm anybody, so isn't that great? And then I say, right, but upon what basis do you believe in it? And you say, I have faith. And then somebody says, I'm not a progressive Christianity, and I believe you, Jimmy, you queer asshole, should die. And I say, upon what basis? I have faith. How does the progressive Christian appealing to truth tell the non-progressive Christian that their way is wrong? Faith is not the be-all, end-all. It's just part of the way humans interpret the world. And so okay, so what? what no, 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 that's it's, fine. It's damaging. Hang on, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. I'm going to agree with you, but we're going to get to the actual answer to my question. Okay, fine. You're saying it's not just faith. What is the second thing that you can point to with that non-progressive Christian and say, okay, yes, we both have faith, but the thing that makes your faith untrue and mine true or could still be true is what? We, we see progress in, re, in, your, in religion, in your religion, religious traditions. There is progress throughout the century. Progress so toward what? Believe, you're, just using this progress. As, you're just using this as a powerful word, but it's meaningless. Whether or not something is true or not is not dependent upon whether or not it has changed in a way you would call progress, but it, a, a, a state of change does not indicate truth or non-truth, just as usually when I have this argument with people, whether or not a belief is harmful does not speak to whether it is true or not, though some beliefs are harmful because they are untrue. Um, okay, I'm a little lost now. 
I bet. There is, if you say foundationally it is acceptable for me to believe something on faith, you have no way to say to a person who believes something harmful based on faith that their faith-based belief is wrong. If you say faith is an okay way, an okay foundation, then their foundation is okay. And if they say the only reason, they might even tell you, by the way, I was this kind of Mormon. I love queer people. I just hate their sin. I love queer people, but the government should interfere with them and at least put them in prison. Okay. If I could literally say it is only my faith that tells me that that is true. No other thing. Your belief system says faith is an acceptable method by which to either accept something is true or get to some, uh, uh, conclude that something is true. How do you tell that person, a very real person who existed in my past and exists all over the place that their foundation and that their belief is wrong or untrue with the same foundation as yours? I would show them, I would go to their holy text and I will show them that there are countless passages, hundreds that they don't accept to be, they don't literally apply to their lives. Uh -huh. That nobody follows all of these passages absolutely. Great. So they're not basing their Andrew, let's just do it. Let's just do it. Only on faith. Let's just do it. I'm no longer Jimmy Snow. I am Elder Snow. I am an ex more or I'm a Mormon. Go ahead. I'm going to tell you it is on faith that I, when I read the scriptures, I realize that queer people need to be punished and put away for their queerness. How would you respond to that, Andrew? I, I can, I, I don't know. I'm not a progressive Mormon. I cannot help you with that. I'm not, a, I'm not I, representing a progressive Mormon. You just said you would take a non-progressive person and take them to the scriptures. We'll just go with the Bible. I won't appeal to the book of Mormon at all. You know, the Bible we will just go with the Bible. Tell me my, I tell you my biblical view when I read the Bible is that we must punish the queer people. And you said your response would be to look at the Bible and their scripture and show them show me passages that I don't believe and show that there are ones I don't believe. I already know. Do you want me to just skip to what my response as the religious person is? Well, if you're asking me, um, I would show them that it says to stone your children and you guys and the most fundamentalist Mormons do not stone their children. So you don't take the Bible literally. That's what I would tell them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and so I have prayed on this. And I've had a confirmation of faith and I have had my faith affirmed and I have faith that it was God who affirmed it, that the no longer stoning your children law makes sense specifically for our secular country. However, perhaps in a Christian, actual Christian country, we would reconsider it. But for where we are today, I have had an affirmation faith based from God that we should reinstate those punishments for queerness while not doing because of my personal relationship with God and the, uh, uh, my faith that he is guiding me to know which parts of the scripture are him and which one came about because of the imperfections of man. Nobody follows crazies like that. Yes, they That's do. Yes, they fucking do. Yes, they fucking do. They are the most popular religions in the world. Catholicism has that level of insanity when it comes to gay marriage and abortion rights and at that level of insanity when it comes to the way they vote in clusters. Mormonism may be the richest, but and yet it, if, even if it's not, it's close to the richest institution in the world, certainly re religious institution, even though it has less membership, competes and therefore has tremendous political power, has been able to turn Utah into a basically a theocratic state and be able to shift policy and affect the people who live there. I have a sister who's getting a divorce and the judge's clear problem with uh, queer appearing people who are uh, have a sexually liberated life is literally causing her barriers. So you want to sit there and pretend that this is the kooky thing. This is the normal thing. You're the kooky thing to religious people, not yeah. the other way around. But what I, you had said that you, when, when you came up against a religious person where there was some disagreement, you would go to their scripture and show them. But when Jimmy mentioned the Mormonism thing, you don't know Mormon scripture, so you can't use that. What would you do if, you, I don't know if you saw the debate last night, but what would you do if you were up with against a Sharia law advocating Muslim like I was last night? How do you convince him? Do you know anything about the Quran? And and are you saying that that his beliefs aren't batshit crazy in the way you just denied others are? I would show them how 
that's how crazy his beliefs are, according to most Muslims. Most Muslims do not even think about beating their wives. He would not be his wife. Um, and the Quran says to beat your wife. So he denies that passage. I would show Daniel Hukikachu that the no, Quran no. says to beat your wife, and you don't believe that. You don't think that Daniel knows the Quran says that, and you don't think that Daniel would actually beat his wife, the guy who literally said that it would be a, a perfectly acceptable portion of law for me to be killed for mocking the prophet? You don't think Daniel would beat his wife? I guarantee you he'd beat his wife. He, he, was, he does not move to Muslim-majority countries. If he was a real Muslim, he would go to a Muslim-majority country. Okay. He wouldn't stay here under the protection Whatever. of the West. What, uh, whatever, Andrew, Andrew, you are monumentally naive. You've made up your own God and you've made up your own reality now as well. Because if you're suggesting that the guy that I debated last night isn't a real Muslim, cool. You go debate him and you go tell him to his face that he's not a real Muslim and because he isn't in a Muslim majority country. That's the stupidest thing you've said today, that he's not a real Muslim because he doesn't live in a Muslim. You can doubt him, but your hashtag no true Scotsman fallacy is bullshit. You have no idea what you're talking about when it comes to other religions, let alone your own. By the way, Andrew, uh, you said something that is false. Uh, I believe it is the interview between Barack Obama and Christine Amanpour that happened recently and his institution where they had multiple women from Muslim countries and Muslim majority countries. And they actually showed statistics that show that most of the Muslim world does, in fact, believe in corporal punishment for wives. They're, they're people throwing acid in faces for honor, for dishonor things. Um, there are the female genital mutilation. These people are, are ab advocating for raping and marrying nine-year-olds. And you're going to sit here and suggest that this guy's not a real Muslim. You're an idiot. I'm saying he picks and chooses like most Muslims do. They don't follow everything to the T. You, you're really bad I, at this. I, I'm saying Sorry, you pick and choose and you're an idiot. The guy you're talking about doesn't pick and choose. You're saying he and you have this confidence and it reminds me of my own dad. And in a way, it's making me feel worse for you and less angry because it's clearly just your ignorance. When my dad and I had a conversation early on about uh, Mormonism, he was surprised to find out or actually just thought I was lying when I said most people in Christian religions, all of them, not just Mormonism, teach about having a personal relationship with God, which he at first just denied. Somehow had lived something like 60 years on this earth and met thousands of Christians and yet didn't believe that other churches taught you could have a personal relationship with God. He thought it was all, basically everybody was having their relationship with always the Catholic priest in the way, that there was no praying and getting direct revelation or a Holy Spirit, that it was all through these authorities. And it was this moment that I had where I was like, oh my God, you just don't know. You have somehow missed what the rest of the world is like. And you just sat here and talking to me and in your response to me revealed that you think progressive Christianity is more popular than moderate or fundamentalist combined. That's insane, no, sir. Not by number. I didn't say by number. I said most Christians are heavily influenced by modernity. They, they, so most religious people are more secular than they are religious. And, and yeah. we were just talking about one specific Muslim that is one of the most extreme Muslims. It's and just, it's just hilarious. It's just hilarious that people. after denying, after denying, you were talking about the popularity of it. You said the word most three fucking times. Yeah, and you're wrong. Okay, then maybe I misspoke. Or you're wrong. You misspoke three fucking times. Right. Yeah. Right after. Andrew, and you misspoke I, when you suggested that Daniel isn't a real Muslim who wouldn't beat his wife. I'm, I'm really sitting here going. The contempt I had arguing with you earlier has actually gone away because I'm sitting here going, there isn't anything Matt and I now can do to change your mind because you won't accept what we say when we say you're wrong about this. This is more true. More people believe this. This is the default. We literally live in America. The most arguably, I mean, not most, but we have a secular constitution and yet people are working against that and literally turning back rights 
in a very non-secular way and now going after new ones, not just abortion that they already did, but now a federal ban on abortion. Not just that, but also maybe we should reassess re uh, this whole gay marriage thing. And and I guess you think that it is done in closed doors, uh, in closed rooms with like 20 or 30 people. I don't know how you live in the world we actually live in and think that most people are more secular than they are religious, unless you're just counting every mundane thing as secular. Today I woke up and had a peanut butter sandwich. That was a secular lunch. Unless you're doing something as silly as that, I don't know how, what percentage, let's just go with this. What percentage of the U.S. do you believe votes in a way that they wouldn't vote unless if they weren't the religion they are? That was that was worded really confusing. I didn't follow it. All right. So let me try and read. I don't it. I don't have a number. I'm not going to have a number for that. Well, what would you guess? Survey, do you think it's more? It would just be my opinion. Right. Um, Let's just take. OK, here's the group of people. You have 100 religious people. They represent the entire U.S. How many of those hundred people do you suspect have cast a vote that if they were not their religion would have been different? Um, I, I, I don't have data in front of me. I, I, I I'm just numbers. asking you your suspicion. Just, just what you suspect that that number is. To, to, be, to be fair, Andrew, I have no idea what number I would put on it. So... Yeah, I, it's so complex because some people might be voting what they think is religious, but it's not. I don't know. I, that's a well. The, that's the a other option. Mark, the other option is that people are part of a particular religion that already agrees with them, much like you are. See, you, you think that God agrees with your concept of God. You are like Daniel Hakikachu from last night, relying on intuition. Yeah, I, I actually think that you can, if you go out, and I, I'm not at, this is why I was saying what your suspicion is, if you go out, because I don't have the exact number, but I would say I've consumed enough data, I have, I, I have researched enough into the topic to confidently say that it's more than half, because you can look at the differences in demographics, you know, if, if you have the same vote and people who are non-religious vote one way and people who are one religion tend to vote another way, and people who are a different religion tend to vote another way, you can say definitively that there is a religious influence to their vote. Uh, and if you collect enough of that, you can get a, a, again, I wasn't ever asking you to get it right. I wasn't, it wasn't a trick question where it was like, ah, ha, ha. I just wondered if you even thought it was more than half, honestly. Uh, and, okay. and it could be I think be I can give more. a number. I think I could give a number. Sure. Since you've clarified that. Well, now, now I clarified America, and gave information and you might just try it, but go ahead. In America, it's probably 60%, but even those 60%, the, their religion is so like influenced by secular values that they think it's their religious ideas. But I think it's around maybe 60. I hope you're right. Except for that, the votes that they're casting, which are different, the secular, the, the secular valued votes would be different. But I hope you're right. I hope that secular humanism specifically, because they're, you know, you could have a secular anti-humanism, I suppose, is tricking religions into updating or not tricking, but are, are compelling and convincing. Uh, I hope you're right that that's true. However, if the votes are still different, that means it is where that is failing, where the appeal of some sort of, some sort of thing like secular humanism comes in is not overwhelming their religious instinct or their feeling of religious duty. And that's the problem. And it still happens. Again, my problem with progressive Christians, because we probably vote almost the in, entirely the same way or close, because on top of, you know, they're often very left wing. I'm, I'm much further left than liberals are, uh, but close enough and in a way that I don't feel resentment. My biggest problem is their foundational defense. I cannot allow a person to say it is fine to uh, uh, believe something based on faith if that foundation can be used to believe in something terrible without demonstration. It's really as simple as that. But I have a question. Andrew, progressive Christian, moderate Christian, whatever the category is, what objectively verifiable evidence has been presented to show that any version of Christianity is true.
um, <clears throat> historical evidence that Christian religion has so much of an influence and a popularity on hum on humankind that the fact that it's influenced um, millions of people throughout the centuries, it's just it, it touches on universal human themes and hu universal human secular values. So or else it wouldn't have been so popular. So so I asked you for objectively verifiable evidence that Christianity is true, and what you gave me was an argumentum ad populum. I think he misheard the question because that that was so far. I mean, you literally presented a logical fallacy, not objectively verifiable evidence. What objectively verifiable evidence has been presented to show that any version of Christianity is true? Uh, I, I already tried the first time. I'm probably not understanding it, or I don't have any objective verifiable evidence. Just religion. So, I'm just appealing why, to religious experience. Wh why on earth would you believe that something is true if you don't have evidence that it's true? Are you just going on intuition the way Daniel was advocating last night? Not just tuition. Religious experience itself. No, religious experience. I, I to have religious, religious experiences. Re okay list one religious experience that you think testifies to the truth of Christianity. Christianity being one of the truths, a just religious experience when I, when I take the Eucharist um, at a mass, it, I feel an overwhelming presence. You're Catholic? You don't remember? So you're a progressive Christian who supports a criminal organization, and your evidence is that when you take the Eucharist, you feel something, therefore Christianity is true. And you don't see that that's logically flawed? I didn't present a logical argument. I'm, I'm sorry. To I'm sorry. Truth, but it's I'm not sorry. All there is. I'm shut up. When I ask you for a reason and you give a reason and I say it's logically flawed, you, it's not a response to say I didn't present a logical argument. I asked you for the reason, the evidence that you have that Christianity is true. You presented a logical fallacy and an argumentum ad populum to begin with, and then the next one you you appealed to personal uh, feeling. But your personal feeling doesn't in any way demonstrate that Christianity is true, because you could have that feeling even if Christianity is not true, correct? Yes. Yes. So you admit you don't. Do you have any good reason to believe what you believe? I presented two. But you, no, it, sir, you have not, not presented any. Criteria, no, so. sir. No, sir, you have not presented any good reason. You presented a fallacy and an appeal to emotion, which is another fallacy. Do yeah. you have a non fallacious reason that you think Christianity is true? Thanks for nothing. Well, I, I think he's just thinking and can't come up with one. Andrew, I have a, a of course few, he can't come up with one. I have a few very, a very quick final questions. You are, first of all, it is true that you are a Catholic, yes? Yes. You also consider yourself a progressive Christian, or you're just advocating for them? No, I consider myself a progressive Catholic. Okay. When the prog oh, progressive Catholic is a bit different than progressive Christian. If a vote on a federal ban on abortion were to happen, church. would you vote for the federal abortion? I would want to take abortion. I, 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 would, I, I would not want to make my religion legal. I, I, I would not want to use the law to enforce if my, the, uh, my views on abortion. If the Catholic Church indicated as the, and, and usually they have to be careful in the way they uh, uh, do the language, but they did this as, as, as well as the Catholic Church back during the Prop 8 days. If they indicated that it was important that you vote on this issue, and then in the same words, 
in the same breath said things like, we must protect the right to life if it was a clear message from the Catholic Church that they were asking their membership to vote against, or sorry, vote in favor of a federal ban, would you then do so? If directed by the Pope, I would have to as a Catholic. <laughs> so, and sir. You think you're a rational person because I, the Pope tells you to do something, you have to. Thanks for throwing your freedom and humanity in the fucking toilet. Earlier, we did an experiment where I asked you about whether or not there are people who will vote their religion uh, basically against their conscience, against how they would actually vote were it not for that religion. And you had skepticism that that would be the case and have just confirmed that you are one you such are one. Catholic that would do so or one such progressive Christian. And so now, to put very simply and then give you let's say 15 seconds to end the call. My final words to you are, that's the beef I have with progressive Christianity. Andrew, 15 more seconds and then it's, we're moving on. Um, no, I, I, I appreciate many, uh, I appreciate secular humanism and I think we're just better off reforming religion to be more secular, more humanist. I don't give a shit what you think. You'll, you'll do whatever the Pope tells you. You have no good understanding of reality. You have no good reason for your belief. I don't care if you if you pay lip service to secular humanism. If you were in, truly in favor of secular humanism, you would not blindly follow what the fucking Pope says, and you would care whether or not your beliefs are true and whether you not have good reasons. You are not honest. You are lying to yourself about who you are and what you believe. Yeah, I hope you sit with what just happened and really think about it. We're moving on. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Bye-bye. See ya. Maybe he'll forgive me, too. <laughs> it, it's just bizarre to me that somebody can call in and act like, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm better than those. Why, why would you have a problem with progressive Christians? Because you don't have a leg to stand on. You don't have a theological leg to stand on. And whether you had a theological leg or not, you don't have a logical, you don't have a logical or a theological leg to stand on. And when push comes to shove, he did exactly what he suggested people would do. The hypocrisy is amazing. Something is happening. Um, and I don't know exactly what it is, but earlier today I saw something and I went, wait, I swear we were only at 94,000 subscribers like a week ago. And we usually only go up about 1500 subscribers a month. However, at the, right before the show started, I said, Hey Matt, just, so you know, we're at 9,400, 950, 94,950, and we will probably pass 95,000 subscribers today. I said today, thinking it would be this evening. That was yeah. an hour ago, and we just passed 95,000. Something is happening. Some content is going crazy on our channel that I haven't seen. Maybe it's a short or whatever. But I did want to say we're, at, we're past 95,000. The verification badge on YouTube is necessary you have to be at a hundred thousand to get there to have it the little check mark that says when the line shows up in a live chat but also it gives us access to other tools as a verified youtube channel and while at our current pace we would almost certainly hit a hundred thousand in another month or two the sooner the better that is always true the sooner the better is always true so if you don't mind it, it costs you nothing it means a lot to us hit that subscribe button uh, uh, and help us get close out that hundred thousand. We're thinking about what we're going to do for that hundred thousand celebration. But we did during this show uh, jump up about another fifty subscribers, uh, and and have now passed ninety five thousand. I will say we've had a couple of really good videos the last couple of days. Just not usually the type I I expect to um, do that. However, uh, uh, let's see. What are the views at? 34,000 people have watched the clip this week. Do you remember Julian who called you with a message from God? I don't, I didn't even remember Andrew until we were three fourths of the way through the call. Julian said he woke up in the middle of the night from a message from God, read the message to you at the end of a show, and then tried to leave before giving a, a, a letting it be scrutinized. Oh, any bells? I, I remember something like that happened. I don't remember what the message was. Oh, forgive your parents. Uh, there are some multiple messages. Oh. Forgive your parents was one. God wishes yeah. for you to do what you're doing for atheists, but for him, because you know deep down that you could 
as effectively uh, uh, as effectively as you are fighting against theism, you could do that on his behalf, and that you have this more eternal effectively. Knowledge. It's easier. Yeah, that, yeah, this, yeah. He, uh, uh, it was, it was. Because you can just tell someone, "Hey, man, you don't have to have a good reason. Just do what the Pope says," and people will 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 go with that and think they're progressive. You're not fucking progressive, Andrew. Yeah, that that blew my mind. Uh, anyway, we'll continue on. Uh, we've got, well, unless you have a preference, I was going to go with line 10 there. Go for it. Eli in Texas says that Sodom and Gomorrah prove the biblical narrative and uh, Eli can prove it. Eli, I'm I'm very excited because I actually reject that we have any good reason to believe that Sodom and Gomorrah was a real event from history. So this is going to be great. We have, I mean, we have no evidence that Sodom and Gomorrah are real places. So how can they prove the biblical narrative? Okay. Um, what we do know is that there is brimstone found in areas where the Dead Sea waters have receded, and so, that brimstone is there. Like it's like you Eli? can find tons of videos where they find the brimstone. Eli and, uh, Eli? and the story of Eli. Can you hear me? And yes, hello. I didn't ask anything at all about brimstone. You are you claiming that you know the location of Sodom and Gomorrah because nobody so far has been able to demonstrate the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. It mentions that the Sodom and Gomorrah were in the plains of the Jordan, and the Jordan drains into the into the Dead Sea, and Lot Eli, went east of the Eli, Jordan. And Eli, does anyone know the location of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, it's in the plains of the Jordan. No, does no, no one knows the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. Scholars, archaeologists, biblical scholars, they have all been speculating and listing possible locations, but no one has identified the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what I can prove is that with the biblical narrative, and this is where this is all together, where the brimstone at where the Dead Sea waters have receded, where the Jordan River drains to. The existence of brimstone does not prove the existence of brimstone does not prove Sodom and Gomorrah, and it does not prove the biblical narrative. And even if you found Sodom and Gomorrah and brimstone, that would not prove anything else in the Bible. It wouldn't prove that it wouldn't prove that God created the earth in seven days. It wouldn't prove that Jesus was the Son of God. None of those things were true, even if you could completely prove Sodom and Gomorrah which you can't do. And well, I just wanted to give a, like, well, in relation to, to the story and what we see in actual like geography is that Lot went east of the Jordan River and Abraham went west. Abraham's you, Eli, descendants Eli are you listening to, to me? At, you're not listening. You, you, Eli, you're not listening to me at all. You don't care what the truth is, do you? I'm telling the truth. No, sir, <laughs> you're not. It's located west of the you, Jordan. You don't, do you, no, sir, you're not. Nobody knows the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a fact. But even if you knew the location of Sodom and Gomorrah and can prove that it be, could, that it was destroyed and that it was destroyed and there was brimstone left, that wouldn't prove anything else in the Bible, would it? Well, what we do know is that Jerusalem is west of the no, Jordan. No, you're Abraham going to answer west. the question that I asked you, or I'm going to point out your dishonesty. If we were to prove today conclusively that we found the location of Sodom and Gomorrah and that they had been destroyed and left brimstone behind, if we could, if we could prove those points at all, what other fact from the Bible would be confirmed by that information? The location of Jerusalem, which is west of the Jordan. No, that would not lo- confirm the location of Jerusalem, but we already fucking know where Jerusalem is. I yeah. can confirm the location of Jerusalem on a map and go there. If we, I'm going to ask you this one more time, and then you're done. If we were to confirm today the exact location of Sodom and Gomorrah and prove that it had been devastated and destroyed, leaving brimstone behind, what other what other claim from the Bible would then be proven true because of that information? Abraham's descendants went to went to Egypt, came back, and they're no, west of the Jordan. No, where Abraham no, used to be. no, no. 
the proof of the existence of Sodom and Gomorrah and its destruction does not prove anything about Abraham. It doesn't prove his existence. It doesn't prove anything about his descendants. That's not the way proof works. Just like finding New York doesn't prove Spider-Man. It's, it's historic. I'm just, I was saying that Sodom and Gomorrah proves the biblical narrative is true. And that and you're just wrong. explained to you why you're wrong. And, right, and I like, just demonstrated you're wrong. I'm going to try to simplify it for you on the off chance that you're missing Matt's point. Let's say tomorrow I watch an asteroid or a, is the asteroid the right word in this scenario? We're just going to go with it. I watch a giant flaming rock hit Austin, Texas, and I write down that it happened, and I write down when it happened and where it happened. In a thousand years, or whatever phrase, whatever number you want, when somebody reads that and confirms something, the physical aspects, they actually read that and they are able to go and do testing, and they confirm that that event actually happened. If I add other details, like the rock came from the sky, it was burning, it blew up this thing, and magic fairies came out of it and gave us all pizza, if somebody confirms a thousand years from them that the rock did indeed hit Austin, Texas, and left the crater as I wrote it, does that mean the fairies part is true? And you could be lying about the fairies, but the truth is that, well, geography. The, it's is a yes or no that, question. You're trying to now expand to save your thing. What Matt is telling you is even if they got the event and the location correct, and we verified that, the other information that is in the story, the other information that surrounds the story isn't also confirmed because the one event is confirmed. And the fact of the matter is you've called in without confirmation of the first event. This is the same stupid logic that people used to try and say that they found the location of Noah's Ark because they found a formation that is roughly in a boat shape in a place that they think is geographically where they were looking for it. And then when they went and tested that area after, they found out it was a natural formation and it definitely wasn't Noah's Ark. And yet multiple people who, Eli, I wouldn't be surprised if you were one of them, still believe that's the landing of Noah's Ark. Confirming I, I, a location or event does not confirm a single other thing than the location or the event. Let me, let me ask a hypothetical related to what Jimmy just said. Okay. Let's, let's assume for a second that we found the remains of a very large boat constructed of gopher wood, and it seems to match the dimensions of what the Bible describes as Noah's Ark and is in that region. Would that confirm any other element of the story? Would it confirm a global flood? Would it confirm that it held all the animals in the world in pairs? Um. I mean, it's uh, evidence pointing to that there's something Would that happened confirm, there. Would it confirm? Never mind. Eli can't be honest. Eli knows the answer is no, it wouldn't confirm that, which is why instead of saying no, he said, well, it would point to this, that, it. No, that's not the way evidence works. You could find a boat that matches the description of Noah's Ark, and that would not confirm a global flood. It would not confirm that animals from all over the world came in pairs to do it. That's not the way evidence works. Well, uh, never mind. I'm, it's like okay. no, you I said never wanna, mind. So I'm moving on. I'm just gonna... yeah. I'm gonna nope. look into the camera and say after the phone call with Eli, Pixie Fairies brought me my favorite pizzas, and in a thousand years, when they watch this video, they will have no reason to deny the Pizza Fairies, which I wish I hadn't thought of because that's probably the thing I most regret we don't have in this world. I fucking love fairies and I love pizza. I just. It baffles me. I mean, granted, I, it's not fair of me. I, I went ahead and let Eli go because uh, for whatever reason, um, Andrew is at least equipped to be somewhat honest and acknowledge. Like if I asked Andrew if we found that boat, would it prove it? And Andrew would say, no, it doesn't prove any of the other things. I'm, I'm confident exactly. in that. Yeah. So there's a different level of gullibility and confusion about the nature of evidence. But Eli's somewhere he recognizes oh that wouldn't prove that 
And the point was, if you could just say, no, that of course that wouldn't prove that, then you'd have to recognize that finding, you could, you could find a, a big sign that says, here are the remains of Sodom and its sister city, Gomorrah, destroyed um, by the wrath of God. And that wouldn't prove that it was actually destroyed by the wrath of God. It wouldn't prove any other thing from the Bible. The Noah's Ark thing wouldn't prove Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah wouldn't prove Noah's Ark. The, the case that Eli and others are trying to make, just I realize that sometimes people get frustrated because we'll short-circuit somebody's argument, call them out, and send them on their merry way. Let me make this clear for people. The case that Eli is trying to make is that if parts of the Bible prove to be reliable, that suggests that it would be reasonable and wise for us to accept, even if only tentatively, other parts of the Bible. And that's not the case. Um, I can tell you three truths and 85,000 lies, and the three truths don't tell you anything at all about those other lies. And just because you don't know how many other lies there are, what, what if you knew that the Bible contained four truths and 85,000 lies, and you found out you knew the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, using that information, tell me which of the remaining 85 or 84,003 facts, which three are true? They, unless they happen to also be about the specifics that you found the evidence for for Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, you have no way of knowing. The, the truth of one thing doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the truth of the other. Last night's debate, we spent a lot of time talking about intuition and uh, how unreliable it is, despite the fact that um, some people seem to prefer it, but some people also have their preferences about um, a particular notion of family and are terrified that their concept of family is going to be taken away. When the truth is, Daniel, nobody can take away your concept of family but you. By and large, you get to have whatever family you want, provided you can find another person willing to consent to be a part of that family. Uh, oh, we have to protect family. I do protect family. I have a great family. Jimmy's family, Arden's family, my brother's family. I got actual blood relatives beyond my brother as well, but they don't want to be named on the show, so I'm not <laughs> going to. Um, it's, it's the nature of evidence was the entire first part of of the debate last night is something we've talked about over and over and over again. And it is just it last week. And, and I'm not gonna remember the name of the call, but last Wednesday, you and I did a show and I was genuinely heartbroken and a little despondent when the show was over because of one of the callers who went from Hey, I just want to have a discussion. Hey, I'm kind of being reasonable. Hey, this to all of a sudden flat out refusing to accept or understand how evidence works for a proposition. It's like, oh yes, oh yes, I see that, I see that, I see that, I see that. No, there's a God. I mean, it, that's that's how it feels. And you, and you think I've done this for ages and I've tried 50 well, I've tried thousands of different ways to have the same conversation. And every time I think, oh, we're, we're leading them, we're getting them, they're about to take a drink. No, nope, you can lead them to the water, but you can't make them yeah. think. Yeah, it, the, the thing that is disappointing in a call like that is I think that people, when they recognize that they're on the other side of the issue, they think that any thought experiment we're then doing with them or any analogy we're presenting is just us trying to win the argument. And it's not, in a lot of ways, we try to arm you so you have a better, uh, a better shot at getting your point across. And when I was talking about, when you said your thing and then I said, okay, let's do this about the asteroid. And all I wanted was the two of us, three of us to get on the same page of reality to go, right, okay, I see what you're saying. With that now in mind, uh, what I mean to say is, Blob, I just want to be on the same page. I want to be foundationally consistent. And when I present an argument like that, or, or not an argument, but an, uh, an example like that, and it's a yes or no question, and you immediately answer something else unrelated, 
that to me is, oh, I can't go there because that undermines my argument and they will have won. I'm not trying to end the conversation at that spot and claim victory. I'm trying to get us to the next step of the same conversation because it's not like I think that one example is going to turn you away from Christianity. I want us to just be able to proceed further and deeper into the conversation. But if we can't agree on the basic facts about reality and that we're conceding that if we aren't all in a shared reality, we have no, we have no other choice but to at least pretend we are. Uh, if we can't start there and move forward with facts about reality, we can't keep going. And it was like at the beginning of his call, he presented this thing and then basically was saying, well, I'm trying to present it as though what I just said is coherent. So why don't you just grant me the argument? And then if the rest of the argument follows, we'll say it's true, even though the foundation of the argument that we're granting you is where the problem is. Yeah. Yeah. Disappointing. Anyway, a lot of people, and granted there was, there was, there was great frustration. I, I had less actual frustration last night despite being in a debate with one of the most despicable human beings I've ever been in a debate with, um, is less frustration. I knew it was going to happen. I was expecting there were, there were things we actually predicted like, uh, and, and, and couldn't get people to bet money on. I was like, he's absolutely at some point not going to be able to resist the urge to misgender Arden, even though she's not there at all. Yeah. And he absolutely did it and then lied about it. And then um, did it again. That with, was one of the things and then that did got it again missed. And with after, on his face. Yeah. after claiming that he was mistaken and you had just thought you had a boyfriend, once again did it yeah. a short term later. Uh, yeah, because he's, he's, he's just a liar. Always the smirk and a dig, where the original smirk and dig is supposed to be just this foundational consensus that we would agree that if you were gay, that would be something. That would matter. And, and yet... Let me one more thing about last night's debate, and then we, we got to get on to more calls. Sure. Um, one one thing to take away. I despise that individual that I was debating. Mm -hmm. uh, I despise everything about his, almost everything about his beliefs, and I uh, will never debate him again. That said, when it comes down to who's being honest, I challenge anyone to make a case that of the two of us, I was anything but honest uh, and that he was hardly honest at all and the proof that jimmy and i and others uh, granted this i guess this doesn't apply to jimmy because he wasn't in the debate last night but the proof that i'm at least uh an honest interlocutor trying to have the best conversation possible is the middle third of that debate where we had an honest discussion about his preferred topic and we found the points where we agreed and we found the points where we disagreed and nothing got heated, nothing got resolved. And we were able to say, here's the way the things are and that this doesn't matter. And it's this way in many of the calls, we have a good call right up until somebody violates reason, acts irrationally, presents an argument that's dishonest or couldn't do what they say they were going to do or says that they care about truth and then demonstrates that they don't or follows yeah. along right up until they would have to admit that they were wrong and then they don't and it's so funny because if i asked um hey jimmy you got a 20 dollars bill in your wallet no no see that's a yes or no question quick no um what if i was trying to convince you that you had a 20 dollars bill in your wallet and you just forgot about it and we went down this path and i led you all the way up and said Here's this case that's now convincing that you've got a $20 bill in your wallet. What would you do to finalize that? A check. Yeah, you yeah. fucking check your wallet. The callers, if you're calling into the show and you think we're wrong, if you think you're right, you think you have a good reason to believe in a God, you think you have a good reason to believe in something supernatural, first of all, before you call in, check your wallet. That's a metaphor. Yeah. Uh, because I don't understand thought experiments. Um, <laughs> check your wallet. This is really easy. Bring your A game. All you ever have to do is say, here's what I believe and why I believe it. And when we ask questions, if you know the answer, you give that answer. If you don't know the answer, you can say, I don't know. Where people get in trouble is pretending they know stuff they don't know and misrepresenting what a logical argument is or should be.
Yeah. And uh, not answering the question they were asked. I will tell you, there's one thing about that middle section that I didn't like. Um, and it's, it's not a huge point, but it was, I think I could bet money and win big on the simple bet that in the near future, Daniel will claim because you weren't as contentious and because you were open and honest and you weren't trying to tear down everything, Daniel will say something along the lines of even Matt Dillahunty agreed that Islam is the most compelling. I, I guarantee you it's going to happen. If he does, he's lying because yep. um, only, only under, you know, one of the reasons, one of the ways that I think Islam might be the most compelling is in, and I pointed this out during my opening, is in what it compels its followers to do. It compels its followers to pray five times a, way, a day, to wear specific outfits, and seemingly sometimes it compels them to commit acts of terrorism, to debate and argue on behalf of child rape and child marriage, to force their women to wear bags, to force them to not leave the house without a male accompaniment, to not allow them to drive. The parade of things that Islam compels its followers to do may exceed any other religion on the planet. I'm not sure about that, but it might. But whether or not it is compelling to someone who's not a Muslim, um, that hasn't been the case because 25% yeah. of the population roughly are Muslim and 75% have not been compelled. Yeah. That was the worst of the three debate topics, in my opinion, because it's literally just what I find oh, I, personally I, compelling, what another, what population at large. Yeah. I, I just thought it was bad. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah. Anyway, let's go down callers. Let's yeah. People been ahead. waiting. Take a pick. Take your pick. Oh, Issa wants to talk I, about the debate with Daniel, but he's, Issa has been here the least amount of time. We have one person who's been waiting almost yeah. three hours. No, no, I want to get, I want to get to X. So X in Ohio, friends are she, him. And, uh, you're the agnostic, but anyway, it says you have a unique utility of belief. What do you mean? Welcome to the show. Yes, sir. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Mr. Jimmy Snow for taking my call. Uh, my unique utility of belief and to define that a little more, I would say also faith. Um, and maybe Matthew, uh, Matt, we could talk about the differences between belief and faith because I know you'd like to pin those down quite specifically before conversation. I, I yeah. would just jump straight uh, to what your unique utility is rather than yeah. all the preamble. Yeah. Sorry about that, sirs. I just, I've been up for a while. It's fine. Like, it's, but even like, this, keep going. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, like, for example, and I know Matt and, and Jimmy is a more prior Mormon and Matt is a prior Southern Baptist, uh, that's a, those are very strict religious thought you guys got very religious come up and out of very I don't need a background on what Jimmy and, no stop stop okay belief is the acceptance of a proposition faith is the reason people give for believing it um, uh, what I want is you say that you have a unique utility of belief I definitely do not need you to tell me what Jimmy and I used to believe well I apologize sir what is what do you mean by a unique utility of belief well uh this might branch out into the to a previous call uh but uh my unique utility of belief is kind of cherry picking in scriptural tomes whether it be the bible or the behind the Gita or others as it were and taking the good from the bad and what i see as truth and they can enlighten my mind and get me on with people in a more respectable way i that's what i do okay so go ahead jimmy i was x what when you how do you determine what to cherry pick what is the function that you use to determine which things you're going to keep and which things you're not going to secular humanism so you're not even defending any faith-based thing you're not defending a religion Everybody is capable of this. Surely if religion, if people weren't adhering to religion and having religious beliefs, we would probably still use historical metaphors that were taken from the Bible, even things that we know aren't true. But, you know, sometimes it might be fun to mention Samson if the metaphor fits. But you're right. saying that you have this unique utility of a belief that one, it's not unique. Most religious people also cherry pick. 
but two isn't actually a defense of belief. Well, I think belief, and the, well, yeah, I haven't gotten into that yet, but to, to defend the belief part is, you know, one of the prophecies in the Bible that people really haven't realized is true and can the only one that's really provable is that the Bible predicted and said that there will always be a remnant in those who believe the truth. And, uh, okay, I, think I, it's I don't have a remnant. And I used to believe. So that there goes oh. that prophecy. Also, Jimmy, the, the name spelled EX. That so on Thursday when the caller called, they said X, and I assumed EX was the mistake of the screener, and that's why I put it. Oh, okay. Put it there. I, I also have oh. my I, I I'm gonna be honest, X. I think we're gonna move on because I already have suspicions about the legitimacy of your calls. The other day you spoke about some personal identity stuff. I'm not gonna call in a question whether or not those things are true. I absolutely not rejecting, but then you started using terminology that when I looked into the terminology, while there were things that were um, adjacent. Well, like now you're now now you're being now you're speaking something about me personally, and before yeah, you X, get into okay, that, X, I'm just let me no, I'm just going to drop the call since you interrupted me. It's, I'm saying well. I think you're a troll, and that's it. And it's over. I, I, I don't, the, the conversation itself, you already said that you use secular humanism to decide which beliefs to keep. You didn't defend belief. And then there was this issue on top and I'd rather just move on. For, for clarity, um, whether you were serious or a troll or whatever else, if you claim that you use secular humanism as your epistemology, you are wrong. Secular humanism is not an epistemology. It is not a method for determining what's true or not. Um, there are things that are consistent with principles of secular humanism and things that aren't. And so even if you were to use the basics of secular humanism to run around judging the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, all of those things, I don't care. Because if your thing is, oh, I'm going to take the good things that I find that are good and true, that's what everybody has done um, who's advocating for truth. And so you don't have a unique belief. You don't have a unique utility of belief. You are running around saying, hey, the Bible says this. Is that true or not? Oh, it seems to be true. I'm going to go ahead and accept that. Then it's irrelevant whether or not it was in the Bible. It's irrelevant whether or not it was in the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita. It was relevant where you found it. The only thing that's relevant is that it's true. So it, at the end of the day, you are just calling in to accept, to say that you're a secular humanist who tries to accept true things. And cool, congratulations, let's move on. But then a prophecy about the remnants will always remain. And But that's the only prophecy. Meanwhile, there are other prophecies that were super vague. Hey, I don't know if you've all heard, there are wars and rumors of wars. Joe, all the no? time. Fucking hear about that shit? <laughs> anyway. Wars and rumors of wars. Uh, I'm going to do another atheist caller that's been waiting for a long ass time. So Alex in West Virginia, you're on the Sunday show with Matt and Jimmy. How are you? Hi, good. Thank you for calling. Er, Thank my call. I appreciate it. Thanks, Alex. Sure. Uh, so yeah, just my question was basically, uh, you always hear that um, from the one side, the side, they ask the atheist um, what it would take for them to believe in, in a God. And for the theist side, um, the argument is always, you know, what, uh, why do you believe uh, what evidence um, supports your belief and stuff like that? But I'm just curious, have you ever asked the theist what would, what would it take for you to disprove their yep. belief? Yeah. All the yeah. time. I, I've done it in, I've done it on the shows. I've done it in debates. Um, it usually, we don't usually start there. Um, but instead of saying, what would it take for you to disbelieve? I usually say, what would it take for you to change your mind? Or what would it take, what would be required for you to, to, to no longer profess this or to, to not accept that? It doesn't matter. I've, I've asked the question many times. Um, I have gotten answers on occasion. Some of the answers, matter of fact, one of the answers, one of the answers came in a debate that I did in, I believe, Red Deer in Canada. And my opponent basically said that if you found, um, if you found uh, uh, Jesus in a tomb, I think it was something like that. Um, that finding finding Jesus's body would convince him that his Christian beliefs were wrong. And I pointed out that 
that's contingent on a whether or not Jesus actually existed. I'm not a mythicist, but they can't demonstrate that he did. Um, it's that so it's contingent on that. It's also contingent on if we found a tomb and there was a body in there and it said, "Here lies the body of Jesus." Which Jesus? How do we know it's that Jesus? They, so he has set up a criteria that is impossible to meet to change his mind. And a number of times I've had believers present similarly impossible criteria to change their mind. And it's it's always fun to point out, yeah, so that not, you're basically saying nothing will change your mind because you're like, uh, you, you've described something that can't be done. It's not like we have DNA evidence to confirm which Jesus we're talking about, uh, which Yeshua ben Joseph we're talking about. Uh, I don't ask it as much on the shows uh, because I'm busy trying to get them to demonstrate that why they do believe and then use that to show they failed to meet their burden of proof and should give it up. Okay, that makes sense. My, uh, my dad responded when I asked what it would take for him to stop believing in God. I'm not kidding. This was his real answer. Well, I think I said, what would it take for you to stop believing in God and realize that you've been wrong? And he said, God would have to show himself to me and tell me so. God, yeah. would, and my dad's, <laughs> my dad's so sure. He, he also then set, followed it with, uh, I've told the story a bunch of times, so I won't do the long one, but he followed it with, I'm more sure God exists than you exist. And I berated him for the stupid thing he had just said, because he had, I, and as that's something you hear in elders quorum as a good comeback any reasonable person will meet you with ridicule because you can test elements of my existence. Uh, that was a stupid thing to say, and you should be embarrassed. Anyway, that was my dad's response. Anything else for us, Alex? No, that's it. I really appreciate it. I suspected as much, but uh, thank you both for your for your input. Thanks, Alex. Hey, thanks for all your patience and for waiting so long to ask. Yeah. Oh, no problem. Two hours of waiting right. for a four minute call. Yeah, it, it's. It's wild. See, this is what happens when you have a question or something you want to present and you just, I, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Let's just keep going in order of time, I think. All right. We'll do, we'll do time. Um, for those of you, we tend to, we give priority to theists, but there are people, people who've been holding for well over an hour, almost two in some cases. So we're going to do one more atheist right now. So is it Ali in England? Hello, how are you doing? Hi, Ali. I'm doing well. It, it says here you're an atheist. Yeah, I'm an atheist. Yeah, man. And and, and you're so you're an atheist calling in to atheists, Ooh. and I believe you're going to ask Thank us a question about God. Well, yeah, it, it is in a sense. It isn't really. I mean, it sort of is. But basically, um, what, what the statement is is that. Why is it death, diseases, war, animosity, and hatred if God created man? Which God? The, the, the supposed God. There, there are many supposed gods. Which God are you asking about? Uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the God of Christianity. Okay. Then there's death, disease, war, I mean, animosity, and hate. I'm, 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 I'm answering your question. According, to, according to the Bible... According to Christendom, there are death, disease, war, animosity, and hatred because men are fallen creatures that brought sin and death into the world. That's what the Bible oh, says. That's right, fucking bullshit. Yeah, no. Okay. I, no goodbye. It's it's no, no, goodbye. It's goodbye. I'm sorry you waited an hour to answer to ask one of the most fundamental, simple questions about Christianity you could have asked that you could have Googled and looked up, or you could have gone to any Christian friend on the planet, but instead you hung out on the phone to ask an entirely pedestrian, banal question that makes all of us atheists look stupid, like we don't know and haven't investigated religion at all. Well, why is this in death? Which God? <laughs> oh, what do you mean, which God? The God that's proposed. Oh, the God of Christianity. You know what? You need to go study the fucking Bible. I... You, you absolutely, you absolutely should, but I'm going to also suggest that you don't because you're clearly too bad, too awful at researching to not wind up believing it. Ali, even if they had invented the technology to high five over a live stream, 
I still wouldn't have because it would have felt like an entirely masturbatory exercise. Yeah, that's real stupid. They think that. Woo. Okay. Yeah. It, <laughs> fucking. This is, I mean, you know, we get, we get accusations quite frequently, both here and in other shows that we've worked on that we somehow managed to pick the stupidest theistic callers that nobody who calls into the show is capable of defending anything, um, that they, they don't have good reasons for it. They don't understand logic. They don't understand anything, they, whatever. And I keep pointing out that I have to deal with and wind up spending almost as much of my time correcting some incredibly stupid and ill-informed atheist. And while I'm happy to answer perhaps confusing or difficult questions, um you know why do they believe this why do they believe that but when it sounds like you're three sheets to the wind and you're asking the most basic question that is addressed in the first couple of chapters of genesis so you haven't even read that far you haven't even hey what's the foundation of christianity oh yes the fall the fall of humanity the foundation of Cre the foundation of christianity the reason that there's war death and destruction of because of what these humans supposedly did. Oh, well, that sounds like bullshit. You know what's bullshit? The fact that we're still talking about you. Next. Yeah. Take your pick. Is it Jamie or, or I think it's Jamie in England. Welcome to the show. Hello? Maybe it's Jaime. Hello? Is it Jamie? Can you hear me? I, I can. Are we pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's correct. Yeah. So, welcome to the show. You're on with Jimmy and Matt. How you doing? Hi. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, just a very short and um, succinct question. Uh, where would you say lies the border between agnosticism and atheism? There isn't a border. They they address two different questions. If you're if if the proposition some god exists if you accept that proposition you are a theist if you reject that proposition you are an atheist agnostic is not a middle ground between theism and atheism atheism and theism address belief gnosticism and agnosticism address knowledge and so one could be a gnostic theist or an agnostic theist someone who believes there's a god but does or doesn't claim it as knowledge um you, you, no. There's no line between agnostic and atheist. You can be both. Yeah, it's not a perfect metaphor, but it's a, a bit like asking what's the line between Mexican and Latino. But it, I guess my my like where I'm stuck, it, where I would consider a border between the two, would be believing that something exists that we don't quite understand, and that might somehow link into everything and then on the other side it's like well this isn't something you can prove so it has to be this how can i put it like god like, so what it, you're it, describing I know god of the gap what, what you're describing is what you're describing is called confusion when you say i believe if i believe something exists but we don't understand and it might link into everything you're saying you believe something that you cannot describe, don't know the function of, don't know the ontology of, you don't know whether it's a God or not. And so if you don't believe that it's actually a God and you don't believe that it necessarily exists, you are not a theist, you are currently an atheist. When you start believing that this thing both exists and is a God, then you become a theist. Okay, so believe it uh, okay questioning like not having the answers to everything i guess uh that's, that's that would relevant. be my fundamental that's, no, that, like, no stop uh, cut off stop line. Right. St that's not stop that's not relevant there is a proposition some god exists three words are you convinced that that proposition is true mm, no then you're an atheist. It doesn't matter. Nothing else you've said makes any difference. Good, Jamie. This is a long silence. We don't do those too long. You good? 
I don't know if we lost his mic or he's just in a stunned silence. So we're going to move on. Thank you, Jamie. Cool. It's wild. Hey, we're, we're down to a couple callers here. Before we take these last two, you guys, please stay on the line. We're definitely going to get to those. If you're a theist or if you have supernatural beliefs or if you have questions about those sorts of things, you can always call in. But this is only one of many programs here on the line network. Uh, Jimmy and I are here almost every Sunday. There will be exceptions to that, especially because in addition to doing all the things that I do, uh, well, actually, it's not all the things that I do. I show up and talk. That's all I do for the line is I show up and talk and annoy Jimmy on occasion. Um, but I also, along with my partner, Arden, who is out of town and therefore uh, I am missing her desperately, um, we have a reptile business. And one of the things going to be happening is that there's a number of weekends over the next few months where we will be at reptile conventions uh, selling our newly produced babies. I've got 35 newly hatched ball pythons over in the other room and another 24, 29 uh, in the incubator after that. And that means there's going to be some Sundays when I'm not here. Don't worry. Jimmy will work out people much better than me on occasion uh, to be in here and do this. But if, you, if you're tired, if you are utterly sick and tired of me and Jimmy, um, you're, first of all, you're just wrong. I mean, there's something wrong with you if that's the case. But I want to let you know that this is only one piece of the line network, which has now crossed the 95,000 subscriber like. If you're not subscribed right now, please consider clicking subscribe, joining the channel, giving us a like, ringing the bell, all of those things. Uh, I've already got a plaque downstairs for my personal channel, but we'd love to have a plaque for this channel as well. And all the things that start happening after the algorithm recognizes, hey, you've got 100,000 subscribers, you're actively producing content multiple times a week with thousands of people watching and participating. That said, uh, yes, I get rec recognized at some of the reptile conventions, not all, but some. <laughs> the other shows here on the line, starting tomorrow, we have Skep Talk beginning at 6 p.m. Who's on Skep Talk tomorrow, Jimmy? Uh, tomorrow is Aaron Ra, and I have to look at the name so I don't fuck it up. It is Mubarak Abu Sharifa, an ex-Muslim. Sweet. That's Skep Talk, where you can call in and talk about skeptical issues, and you can potentially talk about religious issues as well. Not every show here is always about religion. Uh, on Tuesday, we have Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock, but Currently I don't know if we have a guest listed. Yeah, Curr it's yeah, TBD yeah. for the guest We're getting guest. something figured out. And for those of you who don't know, Dave Warnock is um, in in moderate to late stages of ALS. And so his show, Dying Out Loud, is about his dealing with that, how he's living his life, how he's making the most of what he has left of his life, and engaging with other callers that. It is not always an uplifting experience. It is sometimes a very heavy experience. But it is an incredibly important experience to show that one of the most common accusations that gets levied at secular individuals is that we don't have hope. That somehow without religion, we lack hope. And my answer to that is no, what we lack is false hope. Instead, we have realistic expe expectations. I hope that we find a cure for ALS so that my friend Dave and I can hang out every year talking about, hey, you remember when you were dying? <laughs> you remember, you remember, you yeah. remember all this, that, that time we spent dealing with you dying and now, now we got a cure? I hope there's a cure. But in the absence of that cure, I hope that people tune in and uh, find value in Dave's life and in Dave's words and find companionship there for other people who are struggling with similar things. Uh, on Wednesday night, I do a show here. Um, it's a good show. You should tune in. You should tune in. It's the best fucking thing you've ever seen. But no, no, no. It's, it's a, it's a call-in show that is more focused on politics than it is on uh, religion, but we focus on all of it here on Thursday. And that's, that's the 6 PM as well on Thursday. It, is it going to be a 2 PM this week? Yep. Normal show. Trans the OG call -in show is going to be on and it's who, who's on this week. Is it Arden? The OGs Arden and Katie. Oh, wow. You guys, every time, every time Katie and Arden do the show together, it's like, I want them to put back on the same dresses that they, that they had done up for the <laughs> first couple of shows. Yeah. Those um, are good. Because it's like, oh, we're doing OG week. Maybe that's the poll. Should we do next week's show in uh, in those outfits? If they even still have them. I'll tell you but, this. Uh, because I edit everything else and I produce everything else, I don't personally watch most of the shows that I don't produce. However, uh, specifically Katie and Arden. And I also like, I Ben Ben has a couple of really good combos too. The Transatlantic Colin show is basically the only show I don't watch, or I do watch, 
even if it's not homework. Um, yeah, it's a good show. It's, I mean, I'm I'm happy. I I love watching the shows on the network as much as I can, but I often miss Skep Talk because uh, Monday is Rat Day for us because Tuesday is Trash Day, and so yeah. I have a bunch of animals that have to be taken care of, cleaned out, and all that's got to go out in the trash. So I often miss a good chunk of Skep Talk. Fortunately for me, on the weeks when Forrest <laughs> uh, or Gutsy Gibbon are on. Gibbon, uh, on uh, it's like a six hour show so I can get the rat work done while listening to them and still watch most of these show. After. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even miss half. Yeah. That's uh, anyway. man. What a good show for car rides. The forest episodes are. Oh yeah. So, yeah. I, I put those on on the long ones. All right. All right. Here, you ready? Yeah. Yep. I'm good with whatever. We are back into the grind. Dan is a theor theist from Ontario, pronouns are he, him, and has a thought experiment for us, which is really super fun because evidently I don't know what a thought experiment is. That's yeah, a joke, luck. Dan. Welcome, welcome to the Sunday show. Wait, is this Daniel? Yep. I'm kidding. Um, well, Never mind. Go on. Um, oh, oh, wait, like uh, that uh, guy, Matt, debated that. Uh, yeah. So, anyway, um, um, Sorry, I'm a little nervous right now. Um, I have a thought experiment. Um, I tend to think like with atheism, okay, like a, a lack of a belief in God that's sort of following the scientific method. There's no no evidence for it, but belief in the absence of a God, is that falsifiable? Because I tend to think even if um, like a God came down from the skies and like resurrected everyone uh, who was dead and created another universe in front of us and we all saw it and all the spirit stuff happened, I'd still be questioning is that aliens playing a prank on us? Like, did I go yeah, insane? Did the whole world go insane at the same time? Like, is it falsifiable? And is that a so, problem if it's not? So yes, the position that there is no God is falsifiable in principle, because if a God exists and is presented, then the belief that there isn't a God has been falsified. What you're talking about not is whether or not it's falsifiable in principle, but whether it's falsifiable practically. And in order to suggest that it might not be, you're coming up with one example. Uh, I don't know what particular example would be sufficient to demonstrate that a God exists, but generally by definition, a, a God, the God of classical theism, would absolutely be capable of demonstrating that he is who he is. It doesn't matter that we as humans can't imagine how that would work. By definition, that God should have the capacity to demonstrate that he is who he is, and whether he does or not is his problem, not ours. And the only thing that's required for falsifiability is falsifiability in principle, uh, and in practice, we may not be able to do that, but God could. Okay, uh, but if uh, said God was not like of the Abrahamic mythology, like they, they weren't um, omnipotent and omniscient, omnipresent, like if there was some limit to their power, um, and then to come up with other explanations, like, oh, that could be like very powerful aliens pranking us, or the whole world could have gone and seen it at once. It's like, when is it that that God presenting himself would be the more likely explanation than something like, any other kind of conspiratory idea even of like oh that could be hidden mind control technology that some cult is using on the world or um, yeah, i just answered that know, when, when, I, I just okay. answered that i have no idea that's not my problem it's god's problem if god created everything and wants to demonstrate his existence and can't manage to convince us that's god's problem yeah okay so it does um, seem iffy. Like I, I, I get like the un like I, I totally understand what you're saying, but um, um, just with the um, you know, like um, extreme claims require extreme evidence, and it's like, well, I think like whatever extreme evidence could cover that could be explained with like other extreme but less extreme claims. But I get what you mean. Like that's that is God's problem. It's like I, I don't know. And then um, but also I also your question well. One, one second. You also, you've defined a particular God and said, what if God's like this? Okay, I don't know. What if God's like that? I don't know. What if God's like this? I don't know. At the end of the day, you can come up with a number of different hypothetical gods that propose some sort of challenge to verifiability and falsifiability. Um, maybe you'll find something that claims as a God 
that might convince some people it's a God, but doesn't qualify as a God under somebody else's definition. You can do that all day long. At the end of the day, the God of classical theism is one um, that is purported not necessarily to be Omnimax, although that's the shorthand for it generally. But modern theologians would say that not so much that God is all-powerful or that he, God is even defined as all-powerful, but that God has maximal power. God is the most powerful being possible. So he can create a burrito that's really hot, but not a burrito so hot that he couldn't eat it, that sort of thing. And so we can come up with a number of different you know, problems of how would we prove this God? How would we prove this God? And we can do that all, nonstop from now to eternity. Uh, and while it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment for the first couple of attempts, it's not an interesting thought experiment after you get through the 75th God and realize that you still have an endless stream to go. Um, is it um, sound epistemology on my end where I would always look to other explanations? Like, is, is it, does that make me in line with like those Christians who say, oh, like you could never convince me otherwise to all proof. I would just think that's demons trying to take me away from God, whereas I certainly endure it well. Any proof I could think of uh, would probably be, you know, it could be aliens playing a prank on us. Like, is that sound epistemology on my part? Yeah, I mean, Arthur C. Well, kind of. Arthur C. Clarke famously pointed out that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from our perspective from magic. And so, if you if there's something, some technology that you don't understand, you don't have the ability to tell it from magic. But if it's actually technology that somebody has learned then there's some pathway to gaining that understanding uh, and learning that way. So you're, you're in good company in the doubts that you're engaging in and how we would go about proving this. Um, what, what I struggle with, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to completely let you off the hook because um, you're a theist calling in and being honest and taking answers and everything else. So even though this is primarily supposed to be about you defending your beliefs, I'm not going to put you on the spot for that, except for one little thing. Mm -hmm. Everything about this call is focused on whether or not strong atheism is falsifiable, whether or not we would be able to reasonably accept or prove a God if it were to demonstrate itself. Uh, my question is, and you know, you're never obligated to answer any more than you want, but my question is, as a theist, what convinced you, and should it convince somebody else? Um, I do have to um, apologize here. Um, I probably should have put in that like I am an atheist. Oh, what did you say it, when um, you were asked? I, I didn't say um, uh, atheist, but I was also kind of I was nervous when I first came on. I don't know, like atheist and theist kind of sound similar. Like whenever you uh, introduced me as a theist, I thought I heard atheist. So uh, my bad there. Um, okay. Well, and then never mind. I did have the, um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I, I did have a question for um, Matt. Like, if, if I recall correctly, when it comes to free will, you said you're a compatibilist. Uh, uh, so, yes, um, I, I agree with Dan Dennett as a compatibilist that. Free will is not necessarily um, uh, a free will and determinism are not necessarily incompatible. Okay, um, I was just sort of um, curious because I sort of, I guess, if I had to describe, I mean, sort of like very reductionist atheist of like everything's just neurons, everything's reliant on cause and effect, and where particles are, and Granted, um, I might be making a fallacy of reducing everything to that. Um, like, what would account for like any level of free will if we're using the same uh, definition of it? Because um, uh, would, wouldn't the brain be more like a, a biological computer, just responding to things? And like, where would be something in it that gives it something that's not, you know, predetermined or randomized, but like an actual, like. Uh, um, level of of free will like um like would it be a bit so, of, a, of, of a god of the gaps thing of relying on something we can't prove as much as i might be 
too reductionist with it and committing a fallacy myself. So yeah, here's the short answer. Um, there's a video of me and Stephen Woodford, Rationality Rules, talking about free will, where we had this discussion because I was a compatibilist in the sense of defending a, a concept of free will, not libertarian free will, not you know the notion that if we rewound it, it'd be any different. But Dan Dennett wrote a, a book uh, called Elbow Room, The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. And what my position is, I don't, I don't normally, I don't, say we have free will anymore I, I say we have will and that i'm still a compatibilist because i don't think that the concept of will free or otherwise that i advocate for or that we care about um is is in i don't think it's incompatible with determinism and i don't mean that as hard or soft determinism just in general and so the best example that i came up with i did this when uh sam harris and i were, were on stage if Sam got up and jumped off the front of the stage and you know landed in front in the right in front of the front row, um, that's one scenario. If I picked Sam up and tossed him off the front of the stage so that he landed in the same spot, at the end of those two scenarios, I'm on stage and Sam's down in front of the front row. The difference between those two scenarios is everything we actually care about with regard to free will. It doesn't matter if those events were determined. It doesn't matter if uh, there was true freedom in any of it. It doesn't matter if there was libertarian free will. What we care about when we're talking about free will is that in one of those situations, Sam did want to go down in front of the front row and in another one, Sam didn't. But in both of those, he ended up there. And in and then one of the situations, he ended up there because I imposed my will over him. What we care about with regard to free will is ha being able to determine agent responsibility in order to hold people responsible for their actions and to point out a conflict between two agents acting. If a big, strong wind blew da Sam down in front of the front row, um, that would still be a violation of his will, but we, would, we wouldn't care as much about that. It would be in the, in the act of God category. It's not another thinking agent imposing it. That's the best example I've come up with to date for describing what we care about as free will and the fact that our will, whether it is determined or not, um, drives the perspective of both of those two situations and shows us which agent, if any, is responsible for an action. Okay. Um, are you um, familiar with uh, Robert Sapolsky? I don't know. I don't, I, uh, so I, the name isn't um, familiar, but honestly, I'm so bad with names. People call into the show and Jimmy's like, oh, yes, this is so-and-so. from It happened earlier today. I'm bad with names, but go ahead. I see he's, um, he's got a neat course on behavioral biology from Stanford that's um, all just up on YouTube. And he sort of makes a proposition in regards to um, uh, reforming the justice system where, um, you know, he mentions a lot of people who do get a prison sentence rather than an insanity plea. They might just be 1% better than that insane person. Like insanity would be some sort of spectrum and that we're all sort of functioning with our different um, malfunctions from our, our biology and our raising and that we should in fact treat the justice system like an insanity plea only focused on rehabilitation and keeping those people off the streets because that person with a broken brain is like a car with a with broken brakes you don't punish the car but you put it in the garage uh, until you can fix it and if you can't you just keep it off the streets forever and yeah. um, it feels kind of icky because i do like you know, personal responsibility and everything, but I really can't think of an argument against it. That's still personal responsibility. When my truck is in the shop right now, um, not, mm -hmm. not making that up. It's actually in the shop right now. We don't know what's wrong with it. I'll probably find out tomorrow. It'll probably cost me a freaking fortune. Um, but my truck's not an agent. And so we don't look at that and say, Oh, there's a problem with the will, but we still hold that vehicle responsible in the sense that that vehicle isn't currently drivable. 
similarly, and Sam Harris has made this point. I made a similar point back when I was lecturing about um, secular morality over and over again. If it turns out that somebody kills a bunch of people and we have the technology to show that it was because of a tumor in their brain and we remove the tumor and their character is fundamentally changed uh, because of that to where they are no longer a risk of doing that again. What do we do with that person? Should we keep them locked up in prison? Well, generally not, because one of the views of, of incarcerating people uh, is to protect them from themselves, to protect other people from them, and to hopefully um, rehabilitate them so that they are no longer a danger to anybody else. The rehabilitation aspect of the prison system, at least in the United States, is a fucking myth. Recidivism is, is incredible. Our prison system doesn't do anything uh, to reliably uh, result in rehabilitation. That doesn't mean that people aren't rehabilitated. Many, many are. Uh, but it's, it's not what it should be. And yet, in all those situations, we're holding that person responsible. And I would say that if we remove the tumor and there's a demonstration that they are no more a risk, uh, that, you know, it's just like we've taken the gun out of their hand kind of thing, um, then there's no reason to incarcerate them. But because they've shown that they may be prone to this type of tumor, um, I could see putting restrictions on them about not being able to buy a firearm or something like that. Um, I think there's a number of different solutions that address what the actual problem is rather than addressing what we, what we used to think the problem was and our desire for vengeance um, because vengeance isn't justice. Uh, um, as Polsky did uh, mention an interesting um, thing observed, or I guess, I think it was the amygdala and the brains, people with psychopathy is fairly messed up and super prone to um, like anger and then their um, executive control is also messed up. But then about a third of the people on death row also were shown to have defective amygdalas, but just not past that threshold of being an insanity plea. And so now they basically have to die. But um, considering that defective part of the brain and the raising that kind of led them there and all these different factors, like a chaos theory of factors coming together, um, is it really much different than the insanity plea? Well, so the insanity plea, I used to have a big problem with because it would be not guilty by reason of insanity. And I thought that the, that the actual result should be guilty, but insane. Um, yeah. that the insanity is, and, and I apologize for the people who find that word troubling. That's just what it is in, in, in the legal realm, uh, or maybe it's changed, but the mental issue is a part of that agent and is tied to that agent. And until such time as we can fundamentally change that aspect of it, it, it will remain a part of that agent. And so it's still part of what we're holding responsibility. It's just like if you have uh, a condition where your arm flails around wildly and we have no way to stop your arm from flailing around wildly, then you, everybody you smack, it's still your fault, even though you as the cognitive entity had no intent. There's a reason we have a difference between first degree murder, second degree murder, third degree murder, manslaughter, um, uh, negligent homicide and all these various things it's because we recognize that one person killing another is dramatically impacted by the circumstances of that and similarly one person hitting another is going to be very different if you've got this you know flailing limb type thing than if you actually punch somebody and so in much the same way that i have problems with the bible saying thou shalt not kill when the world is more complex than that um <laughs> saying we should lock someone up whether they're you know they've got a mental defect or not um i think that's an oversimplification as well i'd like to see us get a lot more robust in everything that we do with regard to the criminal justice system and with regard to mental health 
Okay. And then um, I, I don't want to take up too much of uh, your guys' time, but um, I did also um, just sort of going back into the topic of religion. Um, there's um, a couple statements which sound kind of woo-woo religious, but I feel are kind of um, provable, like not in a okay. God or an afterlife sort of thing. Okay. Um, the self is an illusion and that um, the universe is intelligent, like not a grand intelligence, but uh, I mean, we're made of stardust, we're part of the universe. So do you think like those can both be stated objectively? Okay, so an illusion has some individual that is being fooled. So if the self is an illusion, who's being fooled? Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty paradoxical. But to, cool. to look at everything like um, a, a cluster of molecules and vibrating particles and energy at the fundamental level and this exchange of particles between individuals and everything, um, and I guess consciousness would just be a fabrication of that. But Yeah, th I mean, there is a context. There is a context in which our perception of self um, is our brain creating something. But when you say the self is an illusion and, you know, well, it's not fooling the self, this is how you got to Rene Descartes cogito, cogito or some, I think, therefore I am, even if the world that I inhabit isn't real at a minimum, because I think I must exist because there must be some me, even if everything I experience is an illusion, it's still fooling a me. So that settles the first one on the second one that the universe is intelligent. Um, the most common arguments for this is that because the universe contains intelligence like us, that we are the universe's way of knowing itself. That's a bunch of garbage because that suggests that the universe had intent or needed intent to create us to be the thing that is aware of it. Um, but just looking at my body, um, my brain thinks my fingernail does not think. It would be a mistake to say that my entire body thinks merely because my brain thinks, and it would be just as much it would be a mistake to say my entire body digests just because my stomach digests. My big toe doesn't digest anything. And so the notion that the universe is intelligent is an appealing kind of distraction um, that may be best viewed as, well, we'll reference Dan Dennett for the second or third time today, um, as a deepity. And a deepity is something that to the extent that it is true, it is trivial. And to the extent that it is profound, it is false. And so if you want to say the universe is intelligent because it contains intelligence, okay, that's trivial. If you want to say it's actually intelligent, that's false. Or okay, um, that hasn't been demonstrated to be true. I can't say that the universe is not intelligent because I don't have the, the ability to investigate the entirety of the universe to say, Yes, this entire universe has, uh, as a property of itself, intelligence. Now, um, would the existence of it, um, like in the sort of medical or metaphorical sense, have to prove intent? Like, uh, I understand uh, there's a number of um, Eastern religious philosophies that say, like, the universe and everything doesn't have to have a purpose. Like, there doesn't need to be a purpose to life. And so, still, like, um, Disregarding I don't like think the universe and intelligent like the universe plan is all No, I don't think the universe right? has a purpose. I don't think the universe needs a purpose. But if you say what I said was it's often said that we are the way for the universe to know itself. That implies that the universe now knows itself because we know. And that the implication there is that the universe had some plan to create us so that it could know itself, which is a contradictory statement, because the type of thing that could plan to do that doesn't need us in order to know itself. It already knows itself and knows it can't know itself, and so it creates something to know itself. I was just talking about one specific statement. Okay. And, um, yeah, no, that's and that, I got to move. I got to move on, um, Dan. I sure. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, have a good uh, yeah. Sunday. Call back another time if you get more questions or on Wednesday night as well. There we go. Uh -huh. All right.
What is potentially my final call for today is from uh, someone that it looks like I'm just going to av- a- interact with here on pretty much a weekly basis. Uh, Issa Kabir, who I debated a week or so ago at Modern Day Debates and who called into last week's Sunday show. You are calling in today to, I guess, ask some question about my debate last night with Daniel. So how you doing? I'm good. That was a disaster. I'm so sorry for you having to go through that experience. It was horrendous. Um, I cool. think for anybody in the Muslim community, it, it kind of like was devastating, you know, um, you would be mistaken. Um, it, so it may, it may be devastating to other people in the Muslim community. Um, but the Muslims that were there, there was a mix of reaction because there were a couple people that were clearly thinking, and there were a couple people that seemed a little frustrated with Daniel, especially when I was when he would say I didn't have an answer, and then I gave a robust, thorough answer that you know addressed secular humanism. But there was also a collection of Muslims there that uh, were absolutely furious with me, and who absolutely think that Daniel wiped the floor with me. So they're not leaving there distraught over having you know their position demolished they think that daniel just is the champion of the anti-secularist uh perspective so what impact this has i'm not completely sure well i i'm really i want to apologize for you know don't, the transphobia don't don't don't, don't you know don't i i, I appreciate it. you say you're, you're you're a nice guy uh, I don't need anybody to apologize on somebody else's half behalf. Um, just like, sure. It, it's just like God forgiving, you know, killing Jesus to forgive me. I don't need that to happen. Just, I appreciate the fact that you're, you're just empathizing, but I knew what was going to happen going into it. I predicted half of, of what happened. I set up another half of what happened. Um, mm. and he's just, he's just awful. What's worse is that he had no arguments, no evidence, and nothing productive to say. And when you, when your objection to being accused of advocating for raping a four-year-old is to say, that's not quite what I said during the debate, but at nine years old, and the audience groans, the debate's over. It felt like his presentation, I don't know if you saw the 80s movie Red Dawn, but it felt like a propagandist piece where he was basically just saying, look, the evil secular humanists are going to destroy the world. And I'm like, look, sir, if you're going to take that position, then you'll have to take the same position that Muslims can do the same thing. It's like, it's an inconsistent thing. And one thing that really pissed me off about what he said was he attacked you being in the military. And he was going and talking about all the American problematic things like Vietnam and um, Iraq and all of these spaces, you know, um, Afghanistan, Korea, Japan, he, he was just going on about how terrible American interventionalism is. I'm like, dude, are you going to do the same thing when Muslims do interventionalism? Are you going to be consistent and hold yourself to accountability? And I, and I like, he does that. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds nice on paper, but you're not holding yourself accountable. You're talking about Muslim suffering. What about other suffering that Muslims inflict, like in Egypt, what happens to cops? What happens in Pakistan to Christians? Like, are you going to talk about that? And I feel like you're not. It's a very disingenuous where you kind of make yourself look good, but you make everyone else look bad. And I found that really disgusting, honestly. Yeah, it's, um, I'm going to, I don't want to spend any, I don't want to, I appreciate the call and, and the support. I mean, sure. I don't want to spend any more time on this today because I've still got to do, I'm going to go back and rewatch it and do, uh, normally I do like a 30 minute debate review for each two hour debate. I'm going to do that for hours, uh, even though I don't know that. Our, our debate review might be like 15 minutes because we, we agreed on way too much for it wasn't a good debate it was a decent really good d- discussion but it wasn't a debate i know um, i'm sorry about the, that uh, i just it kind of had to end it that way we kind of agree and i i can't help that yeah. you know and since you watched the debate last night you know that i i referenced you as well um it, it, yeah. it's bizarre the the hashtag you know no no true muslim fallacy sort of thing going on there um I'm going to do three full debate review pieces because that debate was divided up into three pieces. And so I'm going to have a one that does part one, one that does part three, and one that does 
the things around the debate and a little chunk about part two because part two is a complete waste of time um and part two yeah. no yelling nothing gets heated nothing contentious because i genuinely uh, why would anybody care which religion is most compelling i'll tell you why somebody would care somebody would care if their primary foundation for their epistemology is a rejection of science and analytical thinking and accepting of intuition because now you can argue it, it is more compelling to more people because in, of intuition and that makes it seem as if intuition is reliable when it's not all, all it does really is show that intuition is pretty popular but yeah i hear that that's fair well thank you so much for taking my call and i I'm really, and I know I just, I empathize with you and that was just awful and devastating. And I hear that, you know, you understood what was happening, but I just, I just was really mortified just listening to him I, speak. So that's all I have to I say. I appreciate thank that. Thank you so much. Very good. Uh, uh, very good show as always. Thanks again. I, I appreciate that. I have one question before you, before you go. Um, sure. I, I tried this is this is very difficult because daniel um i had i had a question i was going to ask him that i didn't which i'll i'll get to in just a second uh and that is it's very difficult to talk about islam and muslims and separate it from islamists and terrorism and when yeah. you the two are conflated. I I tried to be very clear that I don't think they're co-equal, but from an outsider's yeah. perspective, it's very difficult to tell. And the question that I asked Daniel that he didn't actually answer because he turned it into something else was, does Islam, his version or anybody's version, because his version advocating for some of the most strict aspects of Sharia law is, is different from what you would do, but does Islam actually endorse or encourage terrorism or is it just really bad and inept at convincing its followers not to engage in that and i ask that question because neither can be true for secular humanism but one of them must be true for islam okay um that's a very fair question um so i think we have to look at postmodernism too because islam was imperialistic that's for sure in the past, but you didn't have the kind of insanity you have now. You didn't have, like, yes, you had the East African slave trade, which was horrendous, but um, like the Ottoman Empire as an empire was seen as relatively good as an empire. Like there's PBS documentary. That, there's a lot of data that shows that it's not like the Muslims that we see now. We see, because see, Arabs really didn't have any power. Now Arabs have a significant amount of power because they've of acquiring oil. So now they have said, we are claiming Islam and they've created a lot of translations. They propagate it, they go to prisons. Salafism, Wahhabism has become, come on the rise. A lot of what are called Sunni Muslims are now heavily influenced by Salafi Islam because Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabia has been funding lots of money and they're very open to militarism. So to answer your question, um, it is difficult. I think in religions in general, it's difficult because there's, particularly the Quran is a very, open text it's very vague it's not very specific so a lot of people can read what they want into it but a lot of modern day warfare cannot work with islam because islam is stuck if you're taking a literalistic position i'm talking about traditional islam you can't use guns you can't use bombs you can't blow yourself up you can't do any of this you have to fight with swords and bows and arrows because everything else is a bidda it's an innovation you're not allowed to do this according to a traditional islamic view so what they do is they do mental gymnastics so let's say me i take this progressive liberal position right and they say oh you're fake you're phony i'm like well you're fake and phony too because you're playing your own cherry picking you're doing your own mental gymnastics to propagate your own position they can't do this kind of stuff according to traditional islam yes there are things like plunder that are problematic like they call it ghazu. that's these are problematic things that we have to navigate and engage but in traditional islam this type of militaristic type of thing of you know kind of guerrilla warfare it doesn't really work because muslims were stuck with the old traditional military route like that which existed all the way up to like world war ii where you got into total war so muslims have now engaged into total war 
and they've made up their own rules that don't fit within the system. This is completely fabricated and constructed. They can't do this stuff. You can't go and snipe children and do any of that stuff according to Islamic law. Whatever the limitations are in a traditional Islam, you can't do this stuff. So that's just using the doctrine. That's that's how it would work. So it was it was interesting to me that um, he was very clear that uh, if I were to say that Muhammad raped a nine year old um, after a proper trial, I should be executed for uh, uh, disparaging the prophet. That's his view. Um, yeah. And it is consistent with um, areas where there are Islamic theocracies. So when I go look up terrorist organizations and stuff, you have you have Iran, Syria, and Sudan as the three primary state sponsors of terrorism. And then there's a number mm -hmm. of different terrorist organizations um, that are Islamic or Islamist to varying degrees, the Abu Sayyaf, the Afghan Taliban, Hezbollah, Al-Shabaab, uh, Al-Qaeda, um, and, and different versions of Al-Qaeda and, and um, uh, Hamas and, and all these things, they, they're in the group as terrorists. Uh, whether or not they all are, whether or not they count as Muslim or not, I, I'm going to leave that as an exercise for somebody else and we're not going to have time to get into it. But sure. given given... Daniel's take on um, basically an, an ex extreme fundamentalist view. Um, how do I know that Daniel isn't a terrorist and isn't part of Al Qaeda? And that's the question I was going to ask him last night, but I didn't get to. And I'm not asking you we to, have to answer no that. Idea. We, we yeah. have no idea if, if he is or he's not. Um, that that's that's a question people have asked. That I'm like. To be fair, what he's though, saying is deeply problematic. It's deeply problematic, you know. To be um, fair, though, so. I don't know that you're not. I know that what you express is anathema uh, to Daniel and to the people who are advocating for this. Sure. And I would think that that it would be very strange to have, you know, a, an Islamic fundamentalist terrorist. Um, advocating for secular humanism <laughs> you know that would that would seem to be uh in conflict as a matter of fact Penn Jillette used to have uh, a bit that he did um which was highly offensive and problematic but it was derived from this same thing that you know is it okay for somebody to lie about their um terrorist intent in order to commit it because he was like if all we're doing is looking for a particular terrorist mm. group and they're all opposed you know before they get on a plane, make them kiss my penis and eat a ham sandwich. And the ones that refuse don't get to get on the plane. And that that's, don't get me wrong, that is uh, offensive and potentially racist and problematic. But the underlying sure. point that he's making is in, it, if we're, we are of the impression that these particular terrorist groups all uh, align with a, a particular version of this particular religion, then that would be the sort of thing and the only that we could do. And the only way to counter that would be for them to actually lie. And so my, my only remaining question to you before we have to go today is, sure. is it the case that the radical Muslim terrorists that are, we'll just say the worst of the worst, are they able to lie? Does it permit them or encourage them to lie in order to proceed with the furtherance of their terroristic goals? I would say for those Muslims, they, they will make an agree, uh, argument for that. There's a, this thing that people don't understand. They bring it up all the time. It's called taqiyya. Taqiyya yeah. means that a Muslim will lie, but they lie to preserve their life. It's not really to preserve their life, to do harm to others. However, some way interpret it that way if they don't really understand the concept of taqiyya, but that's something a Muslim could do potentially. Yeah. But I, we have to understand these Muslims have a lot of cultural baggage. It's all fixed in. Like if we look at European Christianity versus like South American Christianity, it's different. There's a lot of cultural baggage that a lot of people try to pretend isn't there, but it is. Like in Senegal, you can be polygamous. In South Asia, if you're a Muslim, it's a very low likelihood you can be a polygamous person because the South Asian culture is against polygamy, you know? So it's like if you're a Muslim, like particularly in India, that's not going to happen. But if you're a Muslim in Senegal, it's normal. 
So it's like, we have to understand all of this kind of smuggled cultural baggage. People are like, I'm a pure Muslim. I'm like, no, you're not. You have all your cultural baggage smuggled in, you know, just like Christianity. So with this type of situation, these people are upset, they're hurt, they're affected by colonialism. So what they do is they do, these, they, they try to defend their um, position to do these kind of terrible things. So that's kind of what I would say is my hot take on it. Cool. Well, thanks for calling in and everything else. I, uh, Thank you. I got to run. And and uh, let me know next time you're doing a debate or whatever else. Maybe if are you going to be at Debate Con in November? Yeah, I'm going to be debating David Wood. Oh my! On what topic? Uh, is Prophet Muhammad a prophet? <laughs> okay. Well, like what makes him a prophet? He, he just and debated I'm, I'm basically Kenny. Going to use like a Hebrew prophet narrative. I'm like, well, it doesn't. It's not really that much different from all the other Hebrew prophets. So. Yeah. Uh, It'd be interesting because David just debated Kenny on whether or not Jesus was a Muslim, uh, and and Kenny's whole take was uh, under the strict, you know, definition of submission, Jesus qualified. And so, uh, anyway, I asked oh, the question. Bull I'm crap. not going through all the other debates, but well, that was a bull uh, crap. That was a bull crap. And you get you gave a good argument. You your question was perfect. You asked him, "Well, is David Wood a Muslim?" And according to yeah. Kenny's definition, he would have to be. That was correct. That was a correct argument. So I agree. <laughs> Yep. All right. I got to run. I'll, I'll probably right. see you then Me in too. November. Good to talk to you. All right. Jimmy. Yeah. Bro. I don't know Bro. what's going on. Um, since I said it before, we've gone up another 130 subscribers. Well, then I think the first thing we should do is instead of looking at each other in, in surprise and shock, we should say thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today to the Sunday show. Thank you for those of you who subscribe. We're thrilled to be at 95.1 thousand. I genuinely hope, like, if we, if we don't crack 100,000, I, I was going to say by the end of the year. But now, like, it's like once the wheels start cranking, there's some momentum gets built up. And all of a sudden, my channel, which wasn't monetized and so didn't benefit from the, from the algorithm at all, I think I've got like 170, 180,000 subscribers, something like that. And that was without YouTube promoting us all. YouTube's <clears throat> promoting us here. But each one of you who are watching today, if this is the kind of content that you actually enjoy, not only can you subscribe, but you can tell your friends about it and you can interact both in the chat and on our other areas here. Check out our, our little short clips when they pop up and you can help manipulate the algorithm so that we can crack a hundred thousand i would love it's what what's today the, the 17th i th i think we could crack a hundred thousand by before fall. halloween before halloween let's do it like, by fall the 22nd people if you're watching you have the power it's not like there won't be at least five thousand unsubscribed people watching this episode in the next few days i thought when you true. were going to say instead of us looking at each other being surprised i thought you're going to say what i was going to say which was i just want to say thank you I deserve this, <laughs> but I didn't say that. We, we work our asses off. And, and so on the one hand, thank you legitimately, because it does take you to hit it, but also, oh, it's taken so long. <laughs> it's, been, it's been way, um, because our, it, it, one of the frustrations is I have 350,000 on my personal channel that will be going active again here starting soon, doing more political-based shows, uh, uh, shows that start off with more of a news coverage, political events thing. And then we'll have a call in portion and an audience interaction portion in it as well. I've actually been working on that this week, uh, both the production end of it, as well as the sort of planning and, and outlining what it'll be and what bits and segments and stuff will be. In it. And I, the thing that's so frustrating about this channel is uh, this channel performs similarly to what my channel in views and interaction and everything uh, to what my channel performed at when it had 250,000 subscribers. So that's been the one that that's been the part that's been tough where I'm like, we have a 250,000 and depending on how far you go back, people are now stingier when they with their hitting subscribe than they've ever been, even though it arguably affects them less than it ever does. Cause when you hit subscribe, it'll probably show you a couple more videos than usual. And the moment you don't, whether or not it will continue to do so will be dependent on whether you actually click the algorithm. Uh, it, it really is only going to affect your subscriber page or for you page. Anyway, all of that to say, thank you so much. This is exciting. I'm getting all my hopes up and I'm like, fuck it. Let's beat this thing by Friday, the 22nd. Uh, you know, that's, or I guess that's a week from today. No, no Friday. Um, 
That'd be amazing. But yeah, by Halloween sounds like a reasonable goal. I just had, uh, to... by the way, um, uh, just cause this just happened within the last hour. Um, one more thing about last night's debate is that, uh, my debate opponent who is a liar and who advocates for child rape and child marriage and who advocates for death for people who, um, uh, disrespect the prophet Muhammad, the child rapist, um, come at me, bro. Uh, he also lied about Michael Jones known on the internet as inspiring philosophy. Michael and I have debated previously. I think I thought we had a really good debate. Um, we had dinner afterwards, which doesn't always happen with my debate opponents. We have disagreed on things and I've even told him to fuck off on Twitter before, but Michael knows that that's not uh, it's not a thing. It's just me saying, you know, fuck off with that stuff. And yeah. we generally get along. And I appreciate that, even though we vehemently disagree on uh, the God and the other stuff. Uh, during the debate last night, Daniel made a claim about Michael that I didn't believe. He also made claims about Sam Harris that I didn't believe and other things that I didn't believe. So I just said, hey, um, Michael, if you're watching, Daniel just said that you're OK with nine year olds engaging in sexual activity. Um, you know, when you get a chance, clarify. And he tweeted out a couple hours ago to answer your question. I'm not okay with nine year olds engaging in sexual activity or marrying. Daniel Hikikachu was attempting blatant character assassination. Thank you for calling him out on that. That guy, Daniel, uh, is, and you got wrecked. Like, I don't normally claim, oh, I won the debate. I don't give a shit what anybody thinks about who won the debate. Uh, that was an absolute demolishing train wreck that demonstrates why nobody should ever pay any more attention to Daniel. And if you don't agree, cool. You're, You're wrong. You too. can be wrong. Yeah. yeah. That argument was so fucking frustrating because what he was trying to do was say, Matt, because you won't say that you would create laws, which would punish children who have sex with other children. Yeah. Uh, a nine-year-old with a nine-year-old that means you're okay with this anyway and yep. that's supposed to deflect from me being okay with adults compelling and forcing nine-year-olds into sexual relationships two completely yeah. fucking different things and by the way this is not a thing that nobody has talked about you can talk about legal theory of the age of consent for those who are um, under the age of consent and their partner is as well. This is one of those imperfect places in laws where there's no good solution because on the one hand, it probably isn't. Well, it's, there are still laws against uh, adults facilitating sex between children, uh, uh, even seemingly consensual. And there's, but the, the thing that ends up happening, the biggest problem ends up happening are the places that have the least amount of sexual education turn out the people with the, the, turn out the societies with the biggest amounts of unexpected uh, pregnancy, teen pregnancy, but also uh, it, it, because it prevents one of the most nefarious problems with people like uh, uh, religious people who want to prevent you from getting sex education is it stops a child from having language to describe what is being done to them when they yep. are being abused. Uh, and so there's, there's no, I, just the fact that he thought, well, you wouldn't stop a nine-year-old from having sex with another nine-year-old, uh, which again is an imperfect thing, because what are you going to do? Put the two nine-year-olds in jail? That I wouldn't have yep. the government incarcerate children having sex with each other if they are consenting, or seemingly to consent to each other, because there's problems with their even ability to consent. And also something that is noticeable is he talks about this average of nine to 11-year-olds which is specifically the average for assigned female at birth people because that's, a, that's what he cares about. But also there are fucked up traditions in certain parts of the world that uh, I, want, I would want to get more knowledge on before speaking out about. However, at least at the baseline of uh, older Muslim men with young Muslim prepubescent boys, that is apparently yep. in some forms of Islam accepted. And, and yeah, no, nobody cares about that. Yeah. Right. I tell you everyone, by the way, if you're a Muslim and you are interested in debating and you're not a monumental piece of shit, you might want to reach out to us. Um, but you could also reach out to other organizations that I work with, because I'll tell you this, um, Daniel and several other people should send thank you cards to ESA because I talked shit. I talked and I did it on purpose. And for quite a while leading up to this debate, 
I talked mad shit about how awful Muslim apologists are. Um, I, I would put easy as the exception, but let's be honest, uh, bro, you're, you're, you're cool, but they, they're not going to think you're a Muslim and, and I'm not getting into the no true Muslim fallacy, but here's what I know. Andrew Tate is a misogynist who's been incredibly accused and indicted, I believe, for sex trafficking and is a Muslim, uh, a convert, or as Kenny Bomer says, a revert to, to Islam. Um, a gentleman by the name of E.A. Dawa, um, which is his Muslim preferred moniker, um, who used to be known as empathetic atheist until he converted, is in prison now. Um, with i don't know the specific charges but it relates to sex and sexual activity with minors under his care i think it may have been a stepchild i'm not i, I don't quote me on the specifics um but I he's think you're in correct. prison i, I believe um, you're correct though that's the details i remember and then i just had someone send me a video the other day kenny bomer who i debated who david wood debated just yesterday um there's a video of him that's gotten popular on TikTok where He's at a store. Now, I don't know when this happened. Um, it could have been back in 2014 when his wife tried to shoot him for his domestic violence, but he threatened to take off his belt and whip a black man for daring to not mind his own business and call Kenny out for being misogynistic and rude to somebody behind a counter. This, these are the individuals who are publicly representing Islam to the world. Many of them, or some of them, at modern day debates, some of them on larger platforms. What is it about Islam that it seems to attract misogynistic, kitty fiddling pieces of shit? Well, I don't know. That's not all it attracts and draws, but that's certainly a portion of whom it attracts and draws. And they should be glad that I have had the pleasure of interacting with other Muslims who are not awful, so that I couldn't just walk in and say, hey, look, earlier today, we had somebody sitting here uh, advocating for Jesus being a, a Muslim and talking about a religion of peace who threatened to take off his belt and beat a black man for not minding his business while he was being a misogynistic troll. And then I'm debating a guy that is misogynistic and advocates for a child rape and molestation and marriage uh, and a number of other things, including beheading people for daring to say something like, oh, wait, let me just say it. Because in the, in the debate, I said, what would happen if I were to say this? And he got to, then I would be beheaded. So I'll just say it. Muhammad, if the stories are accurate, which you believe they are, was a child rapist. And he has now convinced other Muslims uh, because they need to defend that he was perfect uh, despite not being, uh, that they also need to defend child rapists. And meanwhile, Daniel suggests that secular humanists are all about just do whatever you want. It's hedonism. We're all in favor of it. And yet I'm the one who's rejecting what he says. It is, it is a strange world that I find myself in recognizing that the most rational position is to not hold a God belief, and yet I'm in the minority. 80% of the world roughly has some God belief. They are God beliefs to varying degrees of harm, incredulity, and offensiveness. But while I'm debating them about whether or not their religion is true, I have a suggestion. If you're truly con concerned about how Islam is perceived by the world, about whether or not people are likely to give up a, their religion for atheism. If we need to actually reform Islam and other potential religions, and you're a Muslim, clean up your own fucking house. You get in there and you do what the rest of us have to, have to do. You get in there and point out that this guy is a liar, that what he says doesn't represent the Quran, that what he says isn't what Islam is supposed to be. You know why you don't? Because you can't. You don't do it because you can't. You don't do it for the same reason that the gay-friendly church in San Francisco would love to call out the Westboro Baptist Church, but the Bible fucking says if a man lies with another man as he lies with a woman, they have committed an abomination or deserving of death. You can't say Westboro Baptist Church is wrong, and you can't say Daniel's wrong. 
you can say that his understanding is different from yours, but we have no way of getting to the true understanding because people like Daniel are relying on intuition. And that's why the rest of us, while we value our intuitions, also value being able to train our intuitions by the use of skepticism and critical thinking and relying on the analytical scientific process to come up with the best understanding of the world that we ever have and ever will. And that's the only good way to correct bad information is with better information. And you can't do that with Islam. You can't do it with Christianity. You can't do it with Scientology. You can't do it. And that's why secular humanism is not just superior to Islam. It is superior to every other religious ideology on the planet. Thanks for tuning in to the Sunday show. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow for Skep Talk, 6 p.m. R&R Ra will be there. 40 more subscribers since I last updated. I'll take credit for two of them. You can have the other 38. <laughs> I'll take them. These are patrons. Patreon.com slash call the line. This is our top tier. Okay, bye, everyone. Oh, see you over on R&R's channel. Reading the Book of Mine. Yeah.